Okay. Alrighty. Give me just a second. And we're just gonna... We're gonna... We're gonna find where this is. There it is. And we're gonna tweet this tasty link. Okay. Just a second. Okay, perfect. Boop. Sweet business. What's up, everybody? <laughs> okay, let's see. Ah, we're getting the hellos. Makes sense. Just a second. Eh. Had to scooch my chair over. We're trying to get all the squeaking out of the way now, so it's not a problem when we start getting real spicy with the takes. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Now the viewer count is updated. We just... I, I got a, a brand new teapot uh, for brewing loose leaf tea. Uh, and it also came with the world's tiniest, most adorable cups. I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, I'm just trying really hard not to spill it on anything important in electronic. <laughs> <sighs> okay, let's see. Um, so, uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, which is all of you, we've only been streaming for about a minute and a half, uh, the, uh, the Twitter poll I set up, the, uh, the victorious entry was talking about, like, underrated media and such. Um, the various shows that I really like or think are interesting and worth discussing that for some reason it feels like I'm the only human being on the planet who uh, has ever watched them. So that'll be fun. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I have some in mind, but also, like, you, beloved chat, can obviously volunteer concepts and uh, will possibly discuss i'm not making any promises i haven't seen every show on the planet <laughs> um uh the uh the other fun thing that's happening this week is the rest of the osp crew are at vidcon which is convenient because it means nobody can stop me <laughs> so uh hopefully they're all having fun um i'm gonna try not to oh i don't know spoil anything super cool right now you know <laughs> blues a few episodes behind on kenobi i don't want to spoil that for him so um huh. anyway oh that's right i need to pull up the comments on my phone so i can time out the people who are already trying to spam <laughs> come on guys we just got here Alrighty. um nope we're good okay cool huh I'm already seeing those tasty potatoes in chat. Very nice. Uh, let's see. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry. I, obviously there are shows I want to talk about, but like the first thing I see in chat is Code Lyoko. And I, I feel like that's a show I just completely missed everything about. I know nothing about it. I know it existed. And sometimes I'll spot something in the wild and I'll look up what it is. And I'm like, oh, that's part of Code Lyoko. Cool. And then it just slides out of my brain. I don't know what it is. <sighs> anyway, um, let's see. Oh, nope, chat's just yelling about chaos. That makes sense. Um, <laughs> well, I have seen more calls for leverage than for anything else so far, which makes sense. That was one of the reasons uh, I wanted to talk about this subject, because leverage is a really good show, and it actually has a currently running, or at least, you know, currently mid between seasons uh, sequel series that is coming out that is also good, which is a rarity. Uh, and it would be great to get more people into it at a time when view counts for the show actually kind of matter. Uh, so for those of you who have not uh, heard, <laughs> have not heard the good word of Leverage, uh, Leverage is a show um, that is, just, I think it's self-described as kind of a modern day Robin Hood situation. You got a team of five extremely skilled uh professional criminal well four criminals and one insurance guy uh and together they uh they run scams on evil rich people who usually have evil schemes ripped from the headlines sometimes toned down to be less evil than the real version uh and then they uh they they run a scam on them with their uh very impressive skills in crime and uh 
then they take all the person's money and they help out the uh, the beleaguered innocence that the person was screwing with. Uh, and it's like that for five seasons. <laughs> so it's really good for episodic watching. Like, there are some shows that you kind of, you don't have to binge them, but you sort of have to watch them all linearly. Uh, Leverage is not like that. Uh, Leverage is very episodic. It's a, it's a big anthology series. And it is, I don't know if anthology is the right one, but it's very, it's, it's character-driven ensemble cast, episodic, villain of the week. It's, it's exactly my shit. But it's also just really good. So maybe it will also be your shit. Who knows? Um, yeah, uh, I, I've, I've used it as an example in a couple of videos. I, I, I structured so much of the powerhouse video just around being able to talk about leverage because all the characters in leverage are really good. It's a rare case where like, there are no weak links in the cast. Uh, and you know, it's a character driven story. It kind of has to be like that. Um, uh, yes, it, uh, it is on Amazon Prime for free. It's also on uh, IMDb TV, which I think recently renamed itself. But, like, if you're in the U.S., uh, you can just watch it for free with, like, no shenanigans. So that's great. Um, huh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Treasure Planet. It baffles me that Treasure Planet is underrated. It feels like it should just be such an inoffensive, fun movie. And yet it feels like people are only now realizing that it's just really fun and good. <laughs> um, I think the one, the one problem with Treasure Planet that everybody forgets uh, is the robot guy that shows up like two-thirds of the way through the movie to be the comic relief for the rest of the story. <laughs> he kind of sucks. He, he's got a big token comic relief energy, but the movie's really good and it's beautiful, and the animation's really impressive. It's one of the first... Um, 2D animated movies that started trying to integrate 3D animation for uh, environments and um, uh, vehicles. And uh, more impressively than that, of course, uh, Long John Silver's robot arm is 3D animated and integrated with his 2D animation, which I don't even want to think about how complicated that was. But like, so just from a technical perspective, if you're interested in like the art of animation, it's a milestone well worth watching. It's also just a really fun, sweet movie overall. It's very cool. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, I don't know why. <laughs> Whoa, sorry. Totally blew out the pop filter on that one. Uh, oh, you just Bionicle fans. You can't get me that easily, guys. I know it's a cesspit. I know it's a, it's a tar pit that'll suck me in. Uh, and more importantly, I've already watched one of the Bionicle movies and I wasn't very impressed. So we're, we're doing the underrated media hot takes. And Bionicle absolutely dominated when I was in middle school. I don't think it needs me advocating for it. Um, let's see. What, the, what are these? Dark Scott Pilgrim is an interesting example. I actually, I watched the movie a while back, I think. And I read the whole comic. And I don't think I got the joke. I don't, I don't know what that says exactly. But like the whole thing is definitely that, you know... It's, it's, what if we apply video game rules to real life? That would be fun. What if the main character was just kind of a loser dork? That would be cool. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I don't really like any of these people. So I think I just missed the point on it. Uh, but that's another one that's actually really impressive from a VFX standpoint. So if you're interested in animation and the way they integrate 3D animation and, and like, stunt work and do weird set-breaking twists to, like, just make it look better... I do know the movie is pretty impressive for that. It's also got Chris Evans in a rare villainous role, which I think people like a lot. Um, ooh, Hilda. Yes, that is something I will absolutely advocate for. Uh, Hilda is this just absolutely adorable uh, 2D animated cartoon on Netflix. Uh, it's I think it's heavily based on Icelandic folklore. Um, it might be more than just Icelandic folklore, but parts of it are definitely Icelandic. Um and it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's a non-secret world urban fantasy setting. So it's, it's like a semi-modern environment, you know, the, people have like phones, I think, and, and like, you know, computers and, and stuff like that. Uh, but there are also just like all these folkloric critters, like trolls and little elves and, and Nyssa and stuff like that. Uh, and they're just a known factor, uh, and the main character, Hilda, is just this little girl, uh, who is very adventurous and, and a big fan of the wilderness. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like someone takes, like, a, like, a Ghibli movie and then does it in, like, the visual style of Calvin and Hobbes <laughs> in terms of the cartoony style, 
Uh, it's very cute. It's actually adapted from a comic. Uh, it recently had, semi-recently, uh, it had a movie for the finale called uh, Hilda and the Hall of the Mountain King, which was based on the last volume of the comic, which I'd actually read in advance because I ran out of Hilda <laughs> and it ended on a cliffhanger and I was curious about what happened next. Uh, the comic is interesting. It's one of the pieces of media that I think actually works better as an animation because the voiceover like adds a lot to it. The The ability of the animation to just communicate these beautifully whimsical things uh, that the static uh, art form of comics can't really do so much. Um, but yeah, I definitely recommend it. It's very sweet and heartwarming. The whole thing is kind of about like uh, motherhood to a certain extent and like love and friendship and uh, it, it does that thing where it's got a cute little animal companion and then they make you think maybe the animal companion is going to go away <laughs> and it's, uh, that's an episode that makes you cry, which is how you know it's a good show. Um, and, uh, Hall of Mountain King is also a, it's a good resolution. It takes, <laughs> I think actually the movie did a little more work to explain the finale than the comic did. <laughs> um, like it does a slightly better job explaining how we get from point A to point B. Uh, so I definitely recommend it. It's very cute. It's just a really sweet, like, comfortable watch, I guess. It's got, it's got that kind of extremely cozy aesthetic. Like I said, you know, Studio Ghibli does that sort of thing. Um, it's really good at making environments feel, like, cozy and, and pleasant, and the color grading is beautiful, and there's just a lot of, like, <laughs> it also occasionally dips into just raw existential horror, but they don't do that very often, so you'll be fine. Check it out. It's great. Um... Let's see. <gasps> Cyber Six. Oh, that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> and uh, it is Cyber Six, like the number. I understand the possible confusion. Um, I don't think I watched the whole thing. Uh, it was one of those, like, really niche, like, one season, I want to say Canadian animated series based on, like, an esoteric Argentinian comic, maybe? Uh, I, I might be getting all of those things wrong. Um but it, it's had a slight resurgence in, like, cult classic popularity because the premise of the show is that the main character, uh, by night, she's this, like, gorgeous black-clad vigilante with, like, a cape and a sweet hat. Uh, and by day, uh, he is a mild-mannered teacher at a local school. Uh, <laughs> and so the canonical explicit gender fluidity of the protagonist is something that a lot of people think is really interesting, especially because it came out in, like, I think the early 2000s. Um, it's not, like, a perfect show. I mean, there's a reason I didn't finish it. I think I sort of fell off the plot wagon, like, halfway through, but it's very interesting. It's got a really, like, banger opening theme tune, uh, and I think it was, a uh, an awakening for a lot of people who caught it on TV. So, uh, you know, it might be worth checking out if you're just curious about how wild some uh, less well-known cartoons can get. Um, let's see. Ah, Symbionic Titan. Finally, an excuse to talk about a show that I binge-watched during a finals week. I probably should have been studying. Um, so Symbionic Titan was one of the, I think, lesser-known Gendy Tartakovsky uh, uh, projects. So Gendy did Samurai Jack, a uh, bunch of other stuff. He did the uh, Clone Wars 2D animated series. Um, of, like, little shorts, the one that has Mace Windu just kicking ass through an entire army of robots. So he's that guy. He's great. Um, Blue and I actually saw him talk at a convention we were at in the before time, like, one month before the before time of the pandemic. Um, and he's just a really cool guy. Uh, he just, uh, um, he just really likes animating fight scenes. <laughs> and Symbionic Titan is kind of part of that. Uh, the, the gist of it is... It <laughs> Well, it basically has the exact same premise as Three Below, but Three Below is another underrated show that a lot of people haven't watched, so I don't expect that to really be helpful. Uh, basically, there's like a civil war happening on an alien planet, and the princess of that planet, her bodyguard, and a, like, other bodyguard that is also a robot, like, crash land on Earth and have to blend in and, like, hide out while they figure out what to do. Uh, and coincidentally, they also have, like, robot suits, and they can combine them to form a really big robot, which is good, because the bad guy who took over their home planet is sending really big monsters to fight them. And then it's just basically standard kaiju movie fare. Really big monster shows up, they form a really big robot, and they fight it. Uh, it did get cancelled before it had any sort of resolution, so it is sadly forever unresolved, but that's kind of how <laughs> those situations work a lot. Um... And uh, 
of Titan was really fun. Uh, I think I was in exactly the right headspace to watch it at the time because I think I tried watching it again later and it was not hitting the right buttons for me because that's just how it goes sometimes. You know, some some shows you need to, like, they need to hit you at the right time. And with that one, it's it's pretty niche. A lot of the stuff that Gendy does is, like, very unapologetically what it is, and that means its appeal tends to be fairly narrow. Uh, let's see. Uh... Hang on, sorry. Uh, ooh, Kipo, yes. Uh, Kipo is a good cartoon that didn't get canceled. It actually got a satisfying finale, which is great and very rare for the things we're going to be talking about tonight, I think. Um, Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts. Uh, fun fact about that cartoon, when I started watching it, I was like, oh, how refreshing. A cartoon aimed at children that actually feels like it's aimed at children. It's got fairly simple morals about friendship and, like, wacky fun stuff like that and then i watched the rest of the show and i was like oh i was way off <laughs> just kidding um uh keep on the age of wonder beasts uh is set 200 years post vaguely defined apocalypse uh that took the world that we're familiar with and turned it into a very uh colorful post-apocalyptic landscape it seems like every animal on the planet mutated into something crazy and you know, extra limbs and eyes and all that stuff. Uh, and most of the humans are either struggling to survive on the surface or they live in these underground burrows. And despite that, it really does feel like a kid's cartoon for like the first half of the first season. Um, but it's very charming. Uh, the main character is, I think, voiced by, I want to say, Kimiko Glenn, uh, who's just kind of been in everything recently. Um, does a great job, obviously. Uh, she's also like bright pink, and this is a like in universe like a thing it, it, there's a reason she's pink but nobody ever seems to comment on it nobody else is pink everyone else has like normal human colors so it's clearly odd <laughs> but nobody ever mentions it so i wonder if she's like actually diegetically in universe pink anyway it's very fun um and it has like a solid overarching plot it's got one of the most dislikable bad guys i've ever seen which is pretty impressive because she's just like a normal terrible person <laughs> you know sometimes they're like oh i'm gonna make a super villain and the super villain is gonna be like an evil god or like a dragon or something uh but this is just like she's just like a real shitty lady and it's like ooh, i hate her so much so this is, a, this is good writing um and it got all of its seasons and finished up in a satisfactory way and that means if you watch the whole thing you're not going to be cut off by like boy i sure wish this had a satisfying resolution because it does um, yes, uh, yeah, Kimiko Glenn also voiced Glimmer from She-Ra, so, like, she's been in everything, and she's really good, and she has, <laughs> she seems to be getting typecast a lot as, like, characters with pink themes. Um, let's, see. Karen Fukuhara, is that it? Have, who's, what, how am I mixing her up with Kimiko Glenn? Now I feel silly. Uh, <laughs> sorry, everybody, I gotta make sure what I'm talking about so I don't mislead you all. Uh, just a second. Nobody panic. Oh, it's super Karen Fukuhara. Then who's Kimiko Glenn? <laughs> uh. Hmm. Well, this is unhelpful. <laughs> well, yeah, it's definitely Karen Fukuhara, so that's my bad. Um, wait, hold on. Ah, no, I'm so confused. Have I just been conflating these people? Because Kimiko Glenn was horse in Centaur World, which is another underrated thing uh, that everybody should watch. And I could have sworn that that was the same person as Glimmer. So I maybe I'm just maybe I'm just the idiot here. <laughs> um, uh, but yes. Uh, anyway, everybody should watch uh, Kipo, which is indeed starring Karen Fukuhara. And disregard the fact that I am apparently not as good at distinguishing voices as I thought I was. Um, okay. Generator Rex. Oh my god. That's a that's a throwback. I guess that's the kind of po the point of this stream. Um, I have not watched it in a while. And again, it's a show that I feel like I watched like a chunk of, and then I kind of stopped before it ended. Also, I think it maybe got canceled before it had an actual finale. I don't seem to remember there being one of those. Um, Generator X is another, like, hilariously chipper nightmare post-apocalypse. <laughs> um, the, uh, the gist of it is that there was a full-blown nanite apocalypse sometime in the past. Every human being on the planet is infested with nanobots, and sometimes they go haywire and turn the person into a monster. That's just a fact of life, baby. <laughs> 
And the main character, Rex, uh, I believe, has like a special nanite in him. So he can turn himself into like robot parts, like on purpose. So he can like turn himself into like a little like part motorcycle and like big punchy fists and stuff. Uh, and he also has the ability to fix it when other people turn into horrible monsters, which is a fairly classic, we live in a nightmare world, but this one chosen person can make it a little bit less nightmarish. Um, wait, was there a Generator Rex finale? My bad. Okay. I guess I just didn't finish it. That's on me. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like, like some of these shows, I understand why they didn't exactly get like widespread mass market, uh, appeal, but some of them I'm like, this feels like it totally should have generator rex had a bunch of crossovers with like ben 10 which is actually extremely funny because you know when you do like multimedia crossovers it's it's a bit hit or miss you know sometimes it's like oh this is just you know we got the characters from thing a and we got the characters from thing b and we dropped them in the same room and gave them a bad guy to fight together but in this case like the rules of the worlds of ben 10 and generator rex are kind of different which means they each assume different incorrect things about each other. And I love that. I love it when the paradigm these characters are from just, like, completely clashes. Because, of course, Ben shows up in their world as, like, an alien in one of his alien forms, and they're like, oh, wow, this is one of the really weird, like, nanite plague mutant things. <laughs> and Ben is just like, I don't know what any of you are talking about, but I gotta go, bye, and just, like, phases through the containment unit. And they're like, oh, my God, how do you do that? Quick, go get him, Rex. And, yeah, anyway, all that stuff. Obviously, they end up teaming up to fight a bad guy together. But I just, I remember really liking that beginning bit where it's like, yeah, this is exactly what I expected from these two. Um, let's see. <laughs> I'm running into a lot of things in the comments that I've never heard about. Ooh, Disney's uh, Atlantis The Lost Empire, I will go to bat for forever. Uh, it doesn't, I, what I will say about Atlantis The Lost Empire is it does not feel like a Disney movie. It feels like an action-adventure movie that happens to be animated by Disney. I don't really know why it's like that. Um, but it is very fun. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm going to breathe and uh, drink this tiny cup of tea. <sighs> okay, we're good. Anyway, um, what was I talking about? <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, Atlantis, that's right. Um, it's a really great movie. Quite dark by Disney standards, probably has the highest on-screen body count of anything short of Mulan. Uh, and it's pretty wild. I mean, like, they start off with, like, a whole bunch of submarines full of people, and then, like, 20 minutes later, it's just the main guys, because <laughs> everyone else is dead, and it's like, haha, what a fun, quippy Disney movie. Let's, uh, never speak of all those dead people again. So, but it's a very good movie. Um, it's a great, great fun adventure story. I still, I don't know. I, that one I can understand why why it's underrated. Like, it's a really good movie. But if you're expecting a Disney movie, it's really weird. Um, let's see. Road to El Dorado is kind of in the same boat. Uh, I, I think that one's a DreamWorks one. Um, it's, uh, it's good, fun. I think it's, uh... I wonder, I wonder why Road to El Dorado didn't do as as well as it could have. And I, I almost wonder if it's because it's funnier when you're, like, more grown up. <laughs> like, there are a lot of these movies that are great fun romps if you're, like, a little kid. Uh, but I think the thing is, like, Road to El Dorado is so much about, like, well, like, real historical colonialism and relationship drama. And those are both very fun things. I just feel like they're, like... There may be more fun when you're a little bit out of Disney's general, like, age demographic. Um, haha, <laughs> Stormhawks. Oh, Indigo's never gonna forgive me for talking about Stormhawks when she's not around. <laughs> um, Stormhawks is funny because I've mentioned, I got into it, like, like, I'd say five years after I could have. And if I'd gotten into it at that time, I think it would have permanently rewired my brain. <laughs> it's like... I, I'm a firm proponent of a uh, rule of cool in storytelling. I think that if you're telling a story, you're allowed to have as much fun with it as you want. You can do whatever you want with it. And if, if that means you make something that's just completely self-indulgent and wacky and full of all the aesthetics you love, that's completely fine. And uh, Stormhawks definitely does that. <laughs> it's, um, it's another uh, ensemble cast, sort of episodic, you know, threat of the week. Although it, it's also got a, a big overarching main villain rare for shows like this the big overarching main villain is like a 12 year old girl 
she's like the Empress of Evil, and she's very evil, and also a 12-year-old girl. So that's interesting. Uh, her, like, right-hand bad guy dude is, like, a perfectly normal, by all accounts, adult man. <laughs> and then she's just, like, this this spooky evil lady who is 12. Um, and then you got the main characters. It's, it's kind of animesque, but also not really. It's also 3D animated, and it looks pretty whack. Like, you kind of got to take a second to get used to it. You know, everyone, everyone's got these very, like, huge eyes on, like, 3D animated faces, and they haven't quite figured out how to squash and stretch them in a way that works right, but it's fine. Um, and they all, like, it's, you know, it's a, it's a gang of fun teens, and they all live together on, like, a, like a, like an airship that they own, and it's like, oh, man, if I'd watched this when I was 11, <laughs> this would have been the only thing I talked about for three years. But instead, I watched it when I was closer to 15, and I was like, ah, I'm very mature and cool about this, so everything's fine. Um, I don't know what the acronym LMK is. Please stop spamming it. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, Stormhawks was a lot of fun. Uh, that's another one where I feel like I must have watched the finale at some point, because I've, like, I remember bits from it, but I think I maybe skipped over the back half of the first season to get there just because I was curious. Um, it's very anime, too. There's, like, power friendship power-ups and... Uh, but everyone uses, like, crystal magic batteries and, and stuff like that, so it's got a very kind of magic steampunk vibe. Uh, it's very fun. <sighs> uh, let's see. Red Dwarf. I watched a little bit of it when I was very young, because my parents were fans of it. And I didn't get the jokes, and I never felt the urge to revisit it. So that's on me. That, that's my B. Um, let's see. The live oh Lego Monkey Kid that's what it means um still haven't watched it I'm gonna it's by all accounts incredibly good <laughs> um it's just I've got this like this like mental block that's keeping me from just sitting down and watching Lego Monkey Kid and that mental block is of course that I am also summarizing <laughs> Journey to the West I know Lego Monkey Kid is like a like a sequel it's like all that stuff happened and now it's like a while later we got all these old familiar faces but also new stuff is happening and that's great but like. There's, it's, it's like there's this sort of like uncanny valley for me where it's like if I'm looking at someone else's version of a story that I'm also sort of retelling, I, I don't know, it's like, it's like pushing two same charge magnets together. Like there's something pushing me back from it. Um, and I think a lot of it is just I don't want to like grab their ideas <laughs> and incorporate them uncritically into my brain. Like they've got, I've seen some of the designs they've had for like some of the, some of the demons I've already featured and it's like, oh, those are really cool and very different from mine. And I worry that, like, if I, like, watched all their stuff and then I designed my own bad guys, I'd be like, well, I already know, like, a good way to design this bad guy, just, you know, without even meaning to. But I've, I've seen clips from it. It looks incredible. The animation looks great. Everything I've heard of the voice acting sounds great. So, and I'm really glad it exists. Uh, and I, I talk about this every time the show is brought up because it is still, to date, one of the things I'm personally proudest of. Because we got an email when it was first releasing, before it was even available in the U.S., uh... We got an email from one of the people who worked on it who was like, hey, what's up? I'm on the team of the show. And he was. I checked. Uh, and he's like, yeah, we, we definitely watched some of your videos in preparation for working on this. And I was like, oh, my God. So it's like I, I love this show on principle, but it feels so weird for me to try watching it. Um, huh, let's see. Um, the librarians. Uh, okay, so... For context, uh, the, the team, at least some of the team that did Leverage, a couple years after it, made a show called The Librarians. It is a secret world urban fantasy story. Uh, it stars one of, the, one of the main guys from Leverage and one of the main guys from Leverage Redemption, who was not in the original Leverage. Uh, and it also stars Rebecca Romaine, who played Mystique in the old X-Men movies and is just an overall ass kicker. Uh, and it's just... It, it should be exactly my thing. I'm not sure why I had trouble getting into it. Uh, cause it's fine. It's good. It's got a lot of really cute dynamics. I think it's just like, it was a little bit weaker on like the, the party dynamic front. Like there was a little bit less of we're all friends and we love each other and a little bit more like, like <laughs> part of what makes leverage work is that like, if you watch the very first episode, you can see, okay, there's the potential to be a really good show here, but it's the first episode. Everyone is kind of a walking stereotype. The show has not yet realized that Nathan Ford, insurance guy, is 
not the most interesting main character. <laughs> um, and all the other characters are going to be much more interesting than him. Um, librarians kind of started in the same place and then didn't quite, at least from my perspective, didn't quite knit together quite as well. Um, I think it's like it had a few more like antisocial loner dickheads on the team <laughs> than everybody. Like, you know, they all kind of got thrown together from circumstance. But, like, none of them really seemed like they super liked each other very much. And I was like, I kind of hope they get over that soon. Uh, and I just didn't stick with it long enough to see if they did. And that's, again, that's on me. Um, so given the choice between the two, I definitely recommend checking out Leverage. They got the formula down super fast. And, you know, everyone there loves each other. Everyone there cares about each other. They reaffirm it on multiple occasions. It's just a lot of fun. Uh, oh, my God. Class of the Titans. Ah, why must you speak this forbidden name in my presence? Uh, Class of the Titans is a show that I watched a little bit of, and I think I genuinely couldn't find any more of it at the time. I have since found more of it online. Um, but the gist of it is, I think it's another one of those, like, Canadian cartoons that was all dubbed by the same team that, like, dubbed Inuyasha and all the other stuff. Uh, cause, like, it's all the same voices. Uh, Class of the Titans is another secret world urban fantasy, very kind of Percy Jackson before Percy Jackson was a thing. All the main characters are, like, the descendants of major heroes. Uh, some of them they clearly had to, like, reshuffle a little bit uh, <laughs> to make them make sense. Um, so you got a guy who's like, oh, he's a descendant of Achilles, and his whole thing is, like, he's a super fast runner, but he also has, like, an ankle brace because he's got, like, a weak ankle. You get it? Like, the Achilles heel. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And you got, like a like, a tech genius who's, like... I think his deal was that he was a descendant of Odysseus, I want to say, which was quite cool. Like, it was a very fun little premise. The problem is the show wasn't good. <laughs> the premise was really fun. I wish the writing was better. But the writing wasn't good, and that made me sad. <laughs> um, it's like, maybe if, I, maybe if I turned off my brain and watched it, I'd have more fun. But um, I just couldn't get invested in the characters because the writing wasn't good. That's how it goes sometimes. Um... Sorry, guys, I don't know what Wakfu is. I, I've said so before on previous solo streams. Um, let's see. Uh, what's going on? Oh, Wakfu is a card game thing? I guess that makes sense. Uh, I, I barely tolerated the card games in Yu-Gi-Oh! And that was, like, the whole point. <laughs> Which really means that I was just not the target audience for it. Uh, do I really need to go to bat for Over the Garden Wall? I feel like everybody knows how good Over the Garden Wall is at this point. Um, it's really good. If you haven't watched it, you should. <laughs> it's like a, like a little 10 episode miniseries, uh, very Halloween-y, uh, couple kids, uh, you know, boy and his younger brother get lost in a increasingly surreal environment that, fun fact, you can just map circle for circle to Dante's hell. They're fine. It's fine. They're fine. In the end, everything's cool. Uh, like, half the voice cast are, like, trained opera singers with no previous voice acting experience. The main character is Elijah Wood. <laughs> like, Frodo. I don't know why. He does a good job. It's just like, who the fuck made this and why? Um, but yeah, it's good. Like, I mentally categorize it alongside Infinity Train, which I also am seeing pop up a lot, in that it's another, like, surreal young character turns up in very odd alternate dimension situation and unpacks their situation from there. Uh, Infinity Train's quite good. Uh, every season stars a different protagonist, so it can take a little getting used to. Uh, the first season is a very good, like, intro to it. The second season sort of, um, branches out from there a little bit. Uh, the third season, I believe, gets pretty crazy. And I actually did not see the fourth season, unfortunately, because... When they released the fourth season, they also announced that it was going to be the last season. And that bummed me out too much. <laughs> so that's, um, that's on me. Uh, ooh, Gargoyles. Finally an excuse to talk about a show that I really, really like. Um, so, Gargoyles is a cartoon from the 90s. And for context, it came out, I want to say, after or around the same time that things like Ninja Turtles were just hitting unprecedented levels of success. And so people realized the formula of New York City plus secret protectors of the world that does not understand them equals money forever. So I guess that's how 
uh, they were allowed to make Gargoyles uh, a Disney cartoon by Disney, <laughs> which you wouldn't think by watching it. <laughs> I mean, the animation is, you know, Disney quality. It's quite good. Uh, they occasionally, well, they'll like, they'll get away with cheeky references they couldn't do if they weren't owned by Disney. Like, uh, one of the characters will sometimes be watching, like, Donald Duck on TV. Uh, there's a Halloween episode where the main female lead just fully dresses up as Belle from Beauty and the Beast in her ball gown. Uh, <laughs> and this is a cheeky joke because she has a long-standing romantic subplot with the main gargoyle, Goliath, who's like this big, blue, winged, monster-looking guy. So she... <laughs> She's just like, oh, I've been waiting to walk down Main Street arm in arm with you, buddy. And he's like, oh, yes, this holiday is very convenient for stuff like that, I guess. And she's like, oh, OK. Uh, Gargoyle single handedly inspired. I have this on good authority. An entire generation of monster fuckers. <laughs> um, my uh, my winning formula for getting people hooked on gargoyles is I just sit down and force them to watch the first five minutes. Um because it starts off, well, first I tell them, this is a Disney cartoon, and then I sit them down and make them watch the first five minutes. Because, as mentioned, you would not believe it's Disney by watching it. Because uh, it opens in, like, 996, because it was, uh, there's a thousand-year time jump, and it came out in, like, 1996. So it's, it's clever. It was set in the modern day. Um, and it's at a Scottish castle that's being attacked by Vikings, uh, and the sun goes down and all the gargoyles on the castle, like, crack out of their stone shells and spring to life. And the big one, uh, grabs the Viking captain, holds him over the edge of the castle and says in Keith David's voice like velvet, you are trespassing. And that's all I need to get him to watch the rest of the five episode pilot, which is otherwise kind of a tall order. But like, you just gotta get him hooked until Goliath speaks, and then it's like, all right, they'll listen to him read the phone book. It's fine, baby. Um, yeah, so definitely watch uh, watch Gargoyles. It's really good. Um, well, okay, sorry. Watch the first two seasons of Gargoyles, and you can start skipping around in season two. It's it's another show where it's like there's a lot of incredibly good stuff in it. But it's, you know, it also maybe went on a little too long and maybe the writing team changed for season three and, you know, it's fine. But, like, the, the concept is so good and there's such good stuff in there. It's got one of the best villains ever. Like, half the cast of Star Trek TNG is in it. Um, most notably, uh, Jonathan Frakes and uh, Marina Sirtis uh, play, like, the two main villains, which is funny because, of course, in TNG, Jonathan Frakes is Riker, Marina Sirtis is Deanna Troy, and they are two of the, like, most bland white bread characters in the history of television. And then you get them in this cartoon, and they're, like, they're acting more in five minutes than they did in five seasons of TNG, and they're just really getting a chance to show off and go feral. It's a lot of fun. Um, one of uh, Jonathan Frakes' character's first lines is, uh, pay a man enough and he'll walk barefoot into hell. And that is the line that made Jonathan Frakes willing to do the project. So it's a good cartoon, and everybody should watch it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Technically, the show contains two of the best villains ever. <laughs> Jonathan Frakes plays one of them, and Marina Sirtis plays the other. And they're great for completely opposite reasons. Um, uh, Jonathan Frakes' character, David Xanatos, is... I mean, he's the thumbnail on my Magnificent Bastards video for a reason. He's just such a little shit. He's a great master planner type. He's a lot of fun. Uh, and then the villain that Marina Sirtis plays, uh, D uh, Demona, is like a masterclass on writing a self-destructive villain who dug herself into a hole and now will not stop uh, digging. So it's just incredible. Um, and she really like she 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 goes all in on that role, just vocal performance wise. It's incredible. Like, and you got those two, and then you got friggin'. Keith David is, like, the main guy. So he's talking almost constantly. It's just, like, it's, like, every episode is, like, really violent ASMR. <laughs> um, and you also you get fun little cameos. Uh, there's a lot of, like, Shakespearean stuff in this show. And I think one of the show creators mentioned at a convention um, that they were, like, kind of pleased with the fan base they'd curated because they, they described a relationship in terms of, like, some modern sitcom and didn't really get much response. And then they said, it's like Beatrice and Benedict, and everyone got it. And they were like, oh my God, how lucky are we to have like this kind of an audience? Um, 
the characters Oberon and Titania show up, uh, not as frequently as the character of just Puck, like straight up Puck from Midsummer Night's Dream, who's voiced by Brent Spiner, a.k.a. Data, who's also acting everyone else under the table. It's just a good show. Everybody should watch it. I don't know why this is so hard. <laughs> okay, I guys, I still don't know what Code Lyoko is, so I cannot weigh in. Is that the one where everyone's forehead is really big? <laughs> That's all I got. Um, let's see. Uh, the last unicorn. I actually, <laughs> this is like the one, <laughs> how to talk about this. I have not seen the movie, The Last Unicorn. I have not read the book, The Last Unicorn. I did read a comic adaptation of The Last Unicorn once, and I liked it pretty good. Anyway, uh, let's see. Oh, oh no. Oh no. Chat's going fast again. Uh, oh jeez. <laughs> Magnus Archives. I've talked about Magnus Archives before. Uh, they actually sponsored one of our episodes back when they were still running. It's really good. Uh, it's it's another very fun anthology horror podcast. Uh, so, like, every episode is... Well, the framing sequence is consistent. It's basically one guy is sorting through uh, the, like, the, uh, the files in the Magnus Institute. And they're all from, like, different people's weird paranormal encounters of different kinds. And there is an overarching plot line. But the part of the show that I really liked was basically every episode was a different short horror story being retold by this narrator as he's reading through their account. Um, and it's just, like, a lot of different tones, a lot of different characters. Several of them did not survive to the initial recording, which is pretty cool. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I I'm usually not a big horror person but I am a big fan of Dread, <laughs> and Magnus Archives is really good for that stuff. But also, Magnus Archives is like a shotgun blast of common phobias, and, like, you can be totally fine with, like, 98% of everything they do, and then there might be one episode that uh, makes your entire body itch. So just, you know, be warned. Pay attention to the trigger warnings on the episodes. <laughs> um, Dark Crystal. Oh, right. Dark Crystal. Media that shouldn't be underrated, and I don't know why it is. Um, I mean, for context, I am one of those people who kind of believes that Jim Henson could do no wrong under any circumstances. Like, I'll defend Labyrinth, for crying out loud, and that one's much more controversial. Uh, Dark Crystal is fun. It's... <sighs> Jim Henson, I guess, really liked the idea of exploring the kinds of really crazy fantasy stuff he could do with uh, the creature shop he'd built and all that stuff. Um, and Dark Crystal is kind of his, as extreme as that ever got because, like, Labyrinth is urban fantasy. <laughs> Technically so is Fraggle Rock. Uh, Dark Crystal is full-blown fantasy. It's set in a full fantasy universe with its own rules. There are no humans in it at all. Everything is a puppet. Uh, and it's just... Just really wild. It's a lot of fun. Um, it is a little... It's one of those things where, like, I thought it looked fine the first time I watched it, and then I watched uh, Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, which was the series they made as, like, a prequel to it, uh, and then canceled after one season, so it doesn't really line up. And I was like, yeah, that looks about right. And then I went back and looked at the original, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> the original looks uh, chunkier than I remember <laughs> now that I've seen the new polished puppets. Um, but it's just really cool. I mean, again, not to, not to answer all of these with, you should watch it if you're interested in the technical, like, specifications behind a lot of the production of these things, but, like, I mean, Creature Shop was always kind of at the cutting edge of practical effects and what they could do, and especially now, when CGI is being so much more heavily relied on, probably because CGI studios are frequently not unionized, um... It's just really cool to go back and see, like, what could you do with makeup and puppets and practical effects and costumery? Like, how how much crazy stuff could you do with that? It's just really interesting. Um, I had, uh, my, my mom has, like, this big book of just, like, behind-the-scenes stuff. Well, sorry, to be accurate, she has several big books of, like, behind-the-scenes stuff and the creature shops, like, Muppet development and all that stuff. And it's just really cool. Uh, and there's a lot of really interesting visual designs. I mean, like, everyone kind of gives Labyrinth crap for David Bowie's weird crotch bulge. But, like, they have an entire just set piece in there that's based on the works of M.C. Escher, the impossible Labyrinth, like, with the gravity going all crazy. They just, they were like, yeah, we just did that for funsies. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, whatever. I don't know. I feel like we take it for granted. They do so much cool stuff. 
Um, let's see. <laughs> Darkwing Duck. Okay, I hope you guys aren't... If you guys are talking about the original Darkwing Duck, I have not seen it. I did watch DuckTales 2017, which features Darkwing Duck, and he seems pretty cool. <laughs> but, uh, I don't think I was alive when Darkwing Duck was airing. <laughs> anyway, um... Burn. I keep seeing burn notice brought up. I still don't actually know what that is. That one I've completely missed the boat on. Um, is Madoka Magica underrated? I thought people disliked it because they thought it was overrated. Um, for the record, I think it's fine. Uh, I watched all of the original one season of it. I know they've done like spinoffs and stuff. Uh, and I thought it was cool. Um, I hadn't really seen much Magical Girl stuff before that, so I didn't really know all the stuff it was sort of riffing off of. Um, I think it's a little disingenuous to frame it as like a send-up of Magical Girl stuff because I think it's just a, a darker interpretation of the core premise because with a lot of Magical Girl stories that I've seen, like even classic Sailor Moon is like, being a Magical Girl is pretty thankless a lot of the time. And Madoka Magico was like, yeah, what if that was true, but also the cute little cat rabbit thingy that gave you your superpowers was evil uh, and using you to delay the entropic death of the universe or something. I don't know. That part got a little weird. Um... And it, it's, I guess it's like a good show to watch if you like crying. <laughs> um, and you, sometimes that's the mood you're in, you know? You're like, I'm already in a bad mood. At least this way I'll be in a controlled bad mood. Uh, the first time I watched it, I was like, yeah, that's sad. And uh, then I didn't feel the need to watch it again. But like, you know, it's, uh, for me at least, you know, for, for the broad strokes media analysis I do, it, it's kind of like a, it's a touchstone. It gets referenced a lot. I felt it was important for me to watch it just so I knew what people were talking about with it. Um, oh, happy birthday to the person in chat whose birthday it is. Uh, let's see. Oh, Worm. Uh, oh, Worm. I've heard about Worm. It's, uh, it's like a, like a web serialized thingy, right? You can tell I haven't read it, uh, or watched it or whatever. Um, I did look up some stuff from it because I was once commissioned to draw the, uh, the Simorg character. And I had to look up a description of her. And it's like, oh yeah, that's real spooky. Anyway, then I moved on. But, uh, I have heard only good things about it. I mean, spooky things. Um, is Mob Psycho 100 underrated? I thought it was one of the, like, top-rated currently... Is it currently running? Top-rated newer anime. Um, it is good, uh, and it's got a lot of fun bits. Um, I had trouble kind of sticking with it. I think because I have very basic tastes in media, especially media with superpowered protagonists. Um... Well, again, I, you know, I unironically enjoy a lot of things in the vein of, like, Dragon Ball and Inuyasha and just, like, what if I take a super-powered protagonist with a small cast of friends and then I throw them at a bunch of bad guys over and over? And then Mob Psycho 100 is kind of like, what if pacifism? And it's like, okay, cool, I'm glad it exists, it looks cute. I've seen some really incredible animation from it. Uh, I just didn't really stick with it so much. Um, let's see... Princess and the Pauper, like, like the folk tale, <laughs> is that underrated? Um. Oh jeez. Uh oh, Vinland Saga. I've heard about that one. I think that's the one where it's like, it's just an Icelandic saga that is just like a full blown anime, right? Uh, that's all I know about it. I haven't felt the urge to watch it either. Uh, oh jeez. Oh no. Um. Firefly. I don't think Firefly is underrated, but maybe we should talk about that, actually. <laughs> um, so, here, here's the thing that I, I think I've mentioned before. Uh, I grew up in very, like, classic nerd spaces. Uh, I mean that with all the love in my heart. You know, my parents were, like, some of the original AD&D players. Uh, you know, a lot of sci-fi conventions, a lot of that stuff. And um, there's a Sarah Z video about this semi-recently about, uh, I think it's called The Rise and Fall of Geek Culture, and it was very interesting watching it because it did parallel a lot of my own experience just in this space that I grew up in and around, um, which is that for a while it was a very kind of niche space that was mostly populated by certain intense fans and a lot of like writers and creators. Uh, so you'd, you'd go to a sci-fi convention and it would be like a 50-50 split between like TTRPG fans and like published sci-fi authors and stuff like that. 
Um, and then semi recently, like, you know, last 10 years recently, uh, that kind of started shifting. And uh, a lot of very, like, previously niche things became less niche. And it sort of cascaded into just this general mainstream understanding of things like superheroes and D&D and Star Trek spinoffs and all this other stuff that previously have been kind of relegated to, like, these more of niche spaces. Uh, and I think along with that, there was... Um, there was kind of an a rapid and somewhat traumatic expansion of this previously rather insular and frequently mocked community. And that's, I think, a large part of why you've seen some pushback from, like, old school geeks and nerds about, like, all these new people getting into it who don't understand, you know, they didn't suffer for it. And it's like, yeah, that's good, man. We didn't want to suffer for it either. Um, I bring this up because in the old days, <laughs> when the world was young, uh, Firefly was like, it was like a martyred saint <laughs> in these circles. Um, Firefly got only one season. It was taken from us too soon. Everybody loved Firefly. It, it starred, you know, uh, sci-fi geek's sweetheart Nathan Fillion, and it had a lot of fun stuff in it, and it was done by Joss Whedon, god of the nerds, and, uh, for various reasons, <laughs> a lot of that contextual goodwill has been lost recently. Uh, but I think it's important to know what firefly was to this community before that sort of more recent like oopsies maybe joss whedon's actually not good and maybe we should critically re-examine a lot of the stuff he did and boy it's weird how often he has his male characters face planned into his female leads boobs that's a kind of weird suspicious thing anyway all that stuff um because of course this was after i think it must have been after buffy uh another show that i didn't really watch when it came out uh, and Buffy earned him a lot of goodwill in the uh, in the in the sci-fi fantasy and just general nerd space community, um, especially because it was like a, from what I've heard, f decent like girl power narrative at a time when those were a little thinner on the ground, <laughs> you know, the '90s, <laughs> the dark ages, um, and the deal with Firefly is that it was fun, episodic, character driven, and we only ever got one season. So a lot of the mysteries that were planted in season one never got resolved. A lot of the character drama didn't go anywhere because it, it was canceled. We just didn't get resolutions. And then there was Serenity, the, the finale movie. And I've seen more goodwill towards Firefly than I have towards Serenity. And I think there's a reason for that. And the, the hot take here is that Serenity is not a great wrap up for all that stuff. Um, just the mere fact that it kills off Shepard Book is like, pretty ridiculous because Shepard Book was one of the quintessential characters in Firefly who was a walking mystery. He looked like one thing and he was very clearly another thing. Uh, and then he just kind of gets unceremoniously offed in Serenity, so we never really get a resolution for all his stuff. Um, because Joss Whedon's signature move was unceremoniously offing beloved characters, and everyone thought it was very bold at the time. And, uh, that opinion I don't think has held up so much. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Basically, Firefly was this, like, holy grail of media. And I think it was that, Beloved, because it got canceled after one season. Because I think if it had run much longer, people would have... Eh, the cracks would have been more prominent. They would have mattered more uh, than just, oh, what we got was so good, why can't we get more? Because, like, there are, there are like, tie-in sequel comics to Firefly and Serenity, and I read a bunch of them, and they're also not great. Like, I mean, that's, that's you know, that's not the fault of the original production or whatever. Like, it's clearly a different team. But I think it's pretty indicative of, like, this story was interesting and it had potential, but I don't know how much potential it had. And I think that is what kept the fans kind of orbiting it. It was just this really fun, you know, bite-sized chunk that implied a larger universe that we didn't get. And people wanted it, but they also didn't want it. Like, they wanted to speculate and they wanted to mourn it. Uh, and there were Firefly references all over the place. I don't know how many of you guys watched Castle, but there's, uh, it also stars Nathan Fillion, same guy. And there's a, there's an episode, it's like a Halloween episode, and Nathan Fillion's like, 
character's oh, castle is the character's name. His like Halloween costume is just fully Captain Mal from Firefly. And his daughter's like, what is that, Dad? And he's like, oh, it's from like a show I used to like. And everyone was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so you, it was just a very beloved thing. And the problem is, <laughs> I actually tried rewatching it recently. Um, <laughs> and it's not bad. It's not, it's certainly not terrible. But it's got a lot of bad stuff in it. And if you're watching for that, it's really distracting. And the thing is, like, I... I don't pretend to be an impartial observer of media, and I certainly don't pretend to be unbiased. And with something like this, I was explicitly going back into it because that was around when the stuff about, like, the the Whedon cut of Justice League and the way that a lot of those actors were treated, that was when that was coming up. Um, and so I was kind of like, you know, I've been noticing some stuff in things like Age of Ultron and and, you know, other more recent properties that this guy's worked on that I don't like. I wonder how far back that goes. I wonder if it even extends into this, like, this beloved sacred part of nerd culture. And I watched the first episode and I was like, oh yeah, there it is. So <laughs> it's, um, uh... <sighs> I think it was definitely saved by the fact that we only got one season. Everything I've heard about the plans for later seasons, I'm like, it's good that you left that ambiguous, actually, because that would have been real weird. Um... I, I think I have, like, a Twitter thread somewhere a ways back about when I was watching through this, and I was like, oh, no, that's a really racist joke. Oh, no, the world building doesn't make sense because they're too busy slut-shaving the character to notice that in-universe, that doesn't make any sense. All that stuff. Um, anyway, oh, my God, how long have I been talking about Firefly? <laughs> um, it's just really interesting to me, you know, like, living through this, this like, these layers of fandom archaeology. Um... I'm really excited to feel comfortable going to conventions again because, like, so many of my formative experiences were at sci-fi conventions before it became mainstream. Uh, and a lot of them were, like... Well, basically, especially in those days, like, you didn't get many, like, young people at conventions. You didn't get many kids at conventions. Uh, and you didn't really get that many teenagers at conventions. And you didn't get many teenage girls at conventions. And uh, I had some pretty bad experiences from creepy dudes at cons that sort of made me very uncomfortable with the whole situation. And then, you know, nerd and geek culture kind of exploded and became very mainstream. And now there's just a ton of people going to conventions, which is great. Uh, and also, now that I'm kind of going in a more professional context... I feel a lot better about my attendance. So it's just a very interesting situation. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to revisit it once it's no longer a health risk I'm not comfortable with. Anyway, uh, all right, chat. What's going on? I see a lot of things. <laughs> um, hmm. I've already talked about Infinity Train. It's good. Uh, I don't know what Secret Saturdays is. I'm sorry. It sounds familiar. That's all I got. Uh, let's see. Saint Seiya. <laughs> I, okay. I never watched the original Saint Seiya or read it, but I did watch one of the, like, like single season spinoffs with no context without realizing that it wasn't the original. <laughs> so I think I had a very odd exposure to it. I believe it was called Saint Seiya the Lost Canvas. Um, and I had several questions about their portrayal of goddesses gods you know greek figures like hades and athena um i thought it was pretty funny how they had like oh your childhood friend turned out to be the goddess athena and your other childhood friend turned out to be the evil deity hades and you're some dude in shiny armor have fun <laughs> um and uh, i also thought it was funny how they were like this is athena she's an incredibly powerful goddess she can make a real big bubble and then she has to like stand still in the middle of it and if she ever does anything else the the bubble goes away um <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's see. I, I know the gist of Saint Seiya is, uh, it seems to be, like, it, it, it has, like, the same flavor as, like, magical girl stuff, but for guys that really like swords. Like, that's the vibe I got. Um, believe it or not, I also brought up Cyber Six earlier. Uh, so that, that's earlier in the VOD if you're watching this later. Um, let's see. Farscape, never watched it, sorry. <laughs> Yes, I've heard of Bionicle. I was alive in the 2000s. Uh, I'm not qualified to talk about Ruby. Uh, I've mentioned this a few times. I tried watching it. I personally could not get past the voice acting. That's on me. 
I've occasionally seen clips from later seasons. The voice acting still kind of hurts. <laughs> um, and it's quite funny because I actually know that like for some of the uh, for some of the newer characters, they've like gone out and they've like cast really like really experienced voice actors. Uh, and I saw one clip that was just like the two of those characters like interacting with each other with nobody else. And I was like, oh, this scene is actually quite good. And then it went back to like normal characters. And I was like, OK, I'm going to stop now. That's again, it's it, no shade. It's just I spent so much time paying attention to voice work and voiceover because it's something that really interests me and that I potentially want to like try getting into that I I like honed my ear for it and now uh bad vocal delivery hurts me on a personal level it's just it's my own fault there's a lot of things I can't watch anymore it's not just Ruby uh let's see original Ben 10 I have not watched I've seen a few clips from it but original Ben 10 is very much aimed at like the 8 to 10 demographic and I may be childish in many ways but I am unfortunately not quite that childish. But I did really like Alien Force and parts of Ultimate Alien, so... Um, let's see. Also didn't watch Almost Human. Dragon Prince is fun. Dragon Prince, I feel like, suffered from executive meddling. Not in like, hey, you can't do the story this way, but in like, we're gonna parcel out the seasons to you real slow, and we're not gonna tell you how many seasons you're gonna get. Cause as I recall, it's like you got two seasons and then they were like, this next one's gonna be the last. And they were like, oh God, okay. And they had to speed run like all the stuff. It's like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna go through the holo. Oh, he's the child king, it doesn't go well. Now there's a huge war. Okay, we solved the war. Now maybe we can actually fix everything. And then they were like, good work team. You're getting four more seasons. And it's like, oh, good. It's not like we used all of our notes. <laughs> so that's just, I mean, <laughs> There's a reason all the all the writing I do is uh, answers to nobody but myself, and it's because I don't really like seeing artists jerked around like that. Um, let's see. Uh, Sayuki? Oh, wait, I've heard about Sayuki. That's an anime version of Journey to the West, right? Um, I think. It looks, well, I'll be honest, it looks really generic, so I didn't watch it. Uh... Oh boy, Troll Hunters. Oh man. Uh, okay. So a while back I said everybody should watch Troll Hunters and then they should watch Three Below and Wizards. I stand by that, but you should not watch the finale movie. <laughs> it's astoundingly bad. Uh, it feels like it was written by a team of people who read the notes of the writers for the previous works and that was it. Uh, let me just, you know what? I remember when I looked up who wrote it, I had a moment of like, oh my God, they're still letting that guy make movies. And let me make sure who that is. Uh, let's see. <sighs> Sorry, everybody. Gotta just remember what the name of the movie is. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Troll Hunters and its follow-up series is, were, ooh, wow, Sorry. Only 52% of Google users liked this movie. Like, the Google user movie score is almost always higher than everything else, and I've almost never seen it below an 80%. Uh, <sighs> um, let's see, who directed this? Uh, hmm, not that one. Uh... Oh, <laughs> well, it was partially written by the guys that made Ninjago Master of Spinjitsu, which does not fill me with confidence, but I don't want to get too judgy, so... <laughs> I mean, they also did the Lego movie, which was pretty good. Um... Oh, but it was also partially written by the guy who made Percy Jackson, Sea of Monsters, and Green Lantern. <laughs> I think that's the one where I was like, they're still letting that guy make movies? <laughs> anyway, uh, so Troll Hunters and Three Below and uh, Wizards were Netflix series that were made by Guillermo del Toro, who I love in terms of his urban fantasy skill writing. He's just really good. Uh, he, he produces these very fun, sweet, heart-wrenching settings that I think are just really cool. Um and Troll Hunters was kind of like, oh, you know, main character's like a chosen one with like a suit of magic armor, magical girl transformation sequence stuff. 
uh, and he's uh, tasked with defending the secret world of trolls hidden beneath his quaint town of Arcadia. Uh, and in the process, they have this very interesting character arc about like, okay, you, yeah, you're the chosen one, but like every time you try and go off by yourself and you don't tell anyone else what you're doing, like you get your ass kicked, everything goes wrong, but if you let us help you, things go better. And it's like, okay, the whole message is like the lone hero complex thing doesn't work. You got to have your friends. Um, and then, uh, three below was <laughs> three, like troll hunters was all urban fantasy and it was kind of Arthuriana urban fantasy. It's like the main, like overarching arc villain was Morgan Le Fay, a lot of other stuff like that. Uh, they, they were sort of foreshadowing stuff. I mean, the, the amulet that the main character has is like the amulet of Merlin. And when he invokes it, he says for the glory of Merlin. So it's, it, they're really referencing the Arthuriana stuff very quickly. And then three below is about aliens. <laughs> and I just thought that was fun. I really liked that. They were like, this is full kitchen sink, urban fantasy. We got these guys and we got aliens. Um, and then wizards brought in wizards. There are also just wizards hanging out. I mean, it made sense. Morgan Le Fay is a witch or something. Uh, but also, Wizards only got one season, and it really needed two minimum because they cover a lot of ground, and Wizards, like the other two shows, introduces a new protagonist. And he's probably my favorite of the, like, protagonist gang. He's got a lot of very interesting lore going on and some pretty exciting traumas about, you know, Merlin and stuff. Uh, and he's he's kind of stuck taking the backseat to his own story because they only had one season, and they had to do, like, a whole time travel plot and a lot of other stuff, and cover a ton of ground about the, all the protagonists of the other series. And uh, that means he's kind of in the background of his own story, which is a bummer. Uh, and then they did Rise of the Titans, <laughs> brought to you by the guy who wrote Percy Jackson's Sea of Monsters and Green Lantern 2011. <laughs> and I wonder why it was bad. <laughs> it involves a retcon at the end of the movie where they undo the events of every single show back to the very beginning, and they change how it begins. It's like, we're going to give the amulet to this other guy. That's fun, right? And also there's a major subplot throughout the movie where a male character is pregnant with a bunch of alien babies. I can't even explain what the fuck is going on with this movie. And it was such a betrayal, because all the other shows up to that point were good. Like, really good. Even when they were kind of bad, they were still good. So I have no fucking clue what happened there, aside from the acclaimed writer of Green Lantern 2011 and Percy Jackson Sea of Monsters 2013. So yeah, watch Troll Hunters, watch Wizards, watch Three Below, imagine another season of Wizards that we got instead of that, and then don't watch Rise of the Titans unless you want a lesson in how to not end your show in a satisfying manner. Um, oh, jeez, let's see. Uh, I don't know what Megas XLR is. Sorry, guys. Uh, I have not watched Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Didn't really seem like my thing. I actually do sort of read the webcomic Girl Power. I have no idea what's happening in it anymore. I sort of haven't been reading it as critically as I need to to understand what's going on. Uh, seems kind of fun. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> if you like to troll hunters, you'll love Ninjago. I don't know if I trust you on that. <laughs> that doesn't sound right, but I don't know enough about Ninjago to dispute it. Um, I don't know what Kid Cosmic is. Sorry, everybody. Uh, I have heard of Jake Long, American Dragon. Didn't watch it. It's another cartoon I missed the boat on when I was the correct age. Young Justice is complicated for me to discuss. I am one of those people who I think they redesigned the show to make feel unwelcome. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know about this. Uh, Young Justice Season 2 is very different than Young Justice Season 1. And I don't know how legitimate this is, but I do know that a common piece of fandom discourse around that time was that the producers of the show had deliberately changed everything because they wanted to sell more toys, specifically to boys that would be fans of the show. Because the first season is very character-driven. There's a lot of emotional focus on the characters. There are, like, two major romantic subplots in the main cast of, like, six people. Um... Personally, I am not very surprised that this would appeal to a category of, like, young teenage girls who might be interested in finally getting, a like, a like a foothold in a superhero medium that's generally not steered towards them specifically. Uh, and then season two breaks up one of those relationships and completely sidelines the other, time skips five years in the future, never lets the main cast fully hang out, 
and introduces two new young man protagonists to be the focus characters, Impulse and Blue Beetle, and the camera's on them for the entire rest of the season. And the theory that perhaps maybe some executive meddling or showrunner changes of plans was in play to completely change the trajectory of the show so that they could maybe market more to, you know, young men who would want to buy action figures. It's the kind of thing that I don't know if it's real, but I would not be surprised to learn that it was real <laughs> because I have so little faith in the, you know, that kind of soulless corporate nonsense, et cetera, et cetera. So I was one of the people that was kind of shaken out after season two because I watched it. I tried it. I didn't like it very much. And then the show was canceled because for some strange reason, people didn't seem to like season two very much. Um, but then, you know, people really wanted it back. I remember there were years of people yelling about it. They really wanted it back, in part because they kill a major fan favorite character at the end of season two, but they kill him in such a bullshit superhero comic way that everybody knew it had to be, like, temporary. It's like, oh no, I can't believe this character got eaten by the Speed Force. That's like a day at the spa for characters like that. But then they kept insisting he was really dead. And as I understand it, it's two seasons later, and they're still acting like he's dead. <laughs> so... That's fun. Anyway, uh, the thing is, what happened after that is, like, there were years and years of No Young Justice, and I'll be honest, I was kind of happy, because it's like, I loved season one, and then I didn't get any more of the story I liked. I just got a bunch of other stuff that was trying really hard to not do any of the stuff that had worked from season one, while still trying to draw on the same tropes of, like, look, we did that thing where you thought you won, but actually we would pre-planned the solution the whole time, and we're fine now, everything's cool, <laughs> so... They, as I understand it, they do that at the end of every season now, which is pretty funny. Um, and then they got, like, picked up by a different platform for season three. And it was a big thing because it's like, oh, on this platform, we're allowed to show gore. And I was like, this is a kid's cartoon about teen superheroes, right? And they were like, you'd think that. And then, like, the first thing that happens is we see this young woman get brutally murdered, like, 18 times. And I was like, oh, okay. So all the good stuff I liked, you were doing because you couldn't do like animated snuff films okay so i just couldn't stick with season three even though they were doing judas contract which is a story i generally think is interesting uh and i guess now they're just like pulling in random cameos from around the dc animated universe that are just like hey we brought in razor a character from green lantern the animated series a genuinely underrated cartoon that more people should have watched and this character is from this show and nothing else. So if you didn't watch it, you have no idea who this guy is that we just spent an entire episode on. And it's like, that's the kind of episode that is tailor-made to appeal to me. Because I really liked the Green Lantern animated series, and I really liked the character of Razor. And I still didn't watch the episode, because I just really am not feeling Young Justice anymore, and that's a dang tragedy. <sighs> anyway, um, but on that note, Green Lantern the Animated Series is very fun. Uh, it's got like a slightly weird 3D animated style that takes some getting used to because um, it's sort of mimicking the uh, the Bruce Timm style that they used for Justice League and like Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, you know, where all the guys are really top heavy Doritos and all the girls have like the same hourglass shape. Uh, it's like that, but in 3D and it doesn't translate very well but the story is really good at least for the first season so like it's fine uh but it is good <sighs> let's see i don't know what slug terra is guys sorry uh i also don't think i know what wolf's reign is uh good omens is not underrated i think i th you know people like good omens as much as they should good omens is good people watched it it's getting a season two it's after the end of the book Wait, they did Razor Dirty in Young Justice? Well, now I really don't want to watch it. <laughs> uh, Pacific Rim is definitely not underrated. Everybody knows Pacific Rim slaps. Uh, surprisingly, I have not been able to watch Amphibia. Uh, I mean, like, I, I've tried. Something about it. Like, it should be exactly my thing. Secret World Urban Fantasy. Bit of an isekai situation. Shocking moments of dark tragedy in an otherwise fun and kid-friendly series. Always my shit. Um, I don't know. I just have kind of trouble with it. Maybe I'll give it another shot now that it's over. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> I tried watching Shaolin Showdown. I don't think it works as well if you're not a kid. And I'll be honest, I, I know that I'm kind of... My, 
my difficulty with it is not based on any of the writing, although that was also a little bit, you know, weak. Uh, it was mostly just that the main character has a very thick accent, but I know for a fact was being voiced by a white lady. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if I'm comfortable with this for more than like an episode. Uh, ooh, X-Men Evolution. Yes, everybody should watch X-Men Evolution, at least some of the episodes. <laughs> Again, like a lot of these shows that I like are like good sporadically, but the parts that are good are really good. And that's my opinion towards X-Men Evolution. It, especially after like the first season or so, it it kind of becomes sort of very episodic. Like there is an overarching plot in the background, but it's the fairly standard, oh no, mutants are maybe going to have their existence revealed to the world. That would suck a lot. Uh, but they kind of do the... Um, the Justice League Unlimited thing, where it's like, we got a greatly expanded cast, we're going to focus in on small subsets of the main cast, and we're going to give them focus episodes. Uh, and mostly X-Men Evolution is good, because sometimes those focus episodes are about Wolverine, and those episodes always slap. <laughs> this is also the show that invented X-23, like, the emotional core character that they built the movie Logan around, so you know it's doing something good. Uh... It's also got a very fun version of Rogue. Uh, the thing with X-Men Evolution is it has almost nothing in common with the portrayal of the characters in the comics because all the characters, well, most of the main characters are aged down somewhat to be like young teens, uh, which is basically what they also did with the Teen Titans in the Teen Titans cartoon, which also has almost nothing in common with the comics it's based on, which is okay. Again, it's like it's its own thing and it's pretty fun. Um, but if you're expecting to go into it and be like, these are the characters I recognize, that's not how it goes, but it's okay. It's good on its own. Again, you know, this is how we get, like, young girl Wolverine, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and also this is Wolverine at his absolute most dad mode, which is always great. Uh, it's also, I mean, you know, Nightcrawler is always my boy, and it's got a great version of Nightcrawler. And it's funny because the guy who voiced him also voiced Light Yagami. <laughs> And that is some mental whiplash, let me tell you. No matter which direction you go and whether you go from evolution to, to Death Note or the other way around, there's no way to make that not feel like hitting a speed bump. Uh, <sighs> oh, which, yeah, uh, W-I-T-C-H. Um, uh, I know it got turned into a cartoon. Uh, my exposure to it was a comic we added in my middle school library. Uh, and it's really good. It was a lot of fun. It was... Uh, <laughs> It was my first exposure to any kind of magical girl media, and it really worked for me. Uh, the gist of it is that uh, the title is an acronym. Uh, W-I-T-C-H are the first initials of the five main characters who get elemental-themed magical girl powers uh, and uh, access to, like, an alternate dimension fantasy realm because they're friends. <laughs> it's actually pretty funny. It's like... It's like you got a magical girl story happening and you also got like a like a YA heroine uh oh you're actually the princess of this magical fantasy realm come with me and I'll show you this this beautiful realm of which you are queen etc cetera, etc cetera. but that like she, the person who that's happening to is not one of the main characters she's like their friend from school who like they don't they don't know what's going on she just kind of goes missing and then comes back with some weird shit happening and she's maybe evil now and they're like what's going on also what are these powers so like i don't know i thought it was pretty fun um and i remember it being really good with the character drama like it was a character driven story that actually made like the character not just the conflicts but also like how much the characters cared about each other they really made it work um there's also like the main character like she's being raised by like a single mother and they have a kind of fraught relationship and of course while she's doing her magical girl stuff her like she's neglecting her schoolwork and she sometimes like she runs off on her mom without telling her what's going on or so like she'll slam the door on her because there's like a like a friggin' magic ogre in her bedroom she doesn't want her mom to see but her mom's like oh why is will shutting me out so much and i just remember that being really compelling when i was in like seventh grade uh <laughs> oh person in chat saying so ruby but better very based <laughs> um trigon is trigon underrated i feel like it was like a huge deal when it came out um Trigun is like, well, I think it's the anime that put Johnny Young Bosch on the map for voice acting, because uh, he plays the main character, Vash the Stampede. Uh, the one thing about Trigun is that it's one of those ones where, like, they kind of wrapped up the anime at about the 10% mark of the manga, and they didn't really get to explain any of the lore that was revealed later. 
which is basically that uh the main character so uh, how the fuck to explain um it's kind of like a like a wild west space opera thing uh it's really good i mean well the the manga is really good the anime little bit uncertain of because i think they had to really rush the ending and a lot of things just kind of didn't really line up it's like what they did with soul eater you know like a couple seasons and then they had to wrap it up really quickly so the main character like defeats the bad guy by like hitting them really hard <laughs> good work team um but the trigon manga is really interesting very heartbreaking in places and i mentioned this before uh the creator of it also did Kekai Sensen, uh, Blood Blockade Battlefront, which is a much more recent manga and anime that in hindsight, of course, it's by the same guy. <laughs> um, but uh, that one's genuinely quite underrated and very beautiful. Uh, I thought it was really sweet and cool. I think it's a rare case where like the first season of the anime, at least, had no parallel in the manga. Like it was about like a villain and character that they just made up for the anime and somehow it worked really well. So I do recommend checking that one out. I think it got a second season. I have not watched that one yet, but the first season at least I remember really liking. It's also got just some really top tier character designs in it. There's this like dude, how to, <laughs> there's a guy, he's a great dude. There, there's like this guy who's uh kind of, he looks sort of like, like a D and D half orc in a really, really nice, like tailored waistcoat. And he punches vampires <laughs> with like brass knuckles, whatever. Everybody should watch it. It's good. That character is mostly good because he's a really sweet gentleman. Um, okay. Batman, Be Batman Beyond is not underrated. Everybody knows Batman Beyond slaps. <laughs> Come on, guys. Give me some hard ones. Uh, let's see. Okay. Does Legend of Vox Machina really need me to go to bat for it? It also slaps. <laughs> and it was really interesting seeing people get into it who had never watched Critical Role. And, like, didn't really get the appeal, uh, but really liked the show because it's like, oh, it was like fantasy, but they they cuss sometimes and, and like, have sex and stuff. And it's like, yep, good job, team. Um, I liked Legend of Vox Machina because it was paced in such a way that my attention span would actually let me watch it. Uh, so, yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, let's see. I haven't watched Hunter x Hunter, but I know it's by the same guy who did Yu Yu Hakusho, which was really good, so it's probably good. I don't know. Um, oh, no, guys, you can't just list. Ooh, the Discworld movies. Uh, it's been a while. Been a while since I watched them, but I have very fond, formative memories of watching the animated Discworld movies. Uh, the uh, They had one for, I want to say, Weird Sisters and uh, Soul Music? I guess it must have been. Um, I don't know if they're good, but they were very funny when I was little. Uh, and then there are, there have been some live action ones. They did one for Hogfather, uh, that was like a, like a six hour little mini series. And it was great. I'll watch anything with Susan Stohelin in it. And Hogfather was really good. Uh, but also you should just read the Discworld novels. So like, you know, just do that first. <laughs> uh, let's see. Didn't watch Camp Camp. Sorry. I know it exists. Uh, Epithet Erased is fun. It's a YouTube series done by Jellopocalypse, uh, and it's fun and cute and very impressive that the whole thing was, like, animated in-house. Um, let's see. Didn't watch Tower of God, don't know what that is. Everyone bringing up Lego Monkey Kid was not paying attention before. Oh god, Rave Master. <laughs> Rave Master is, I think, done by the creator of Fairy Tale, and it's funny because... I really, really liked Fairy Tale at one point, and I'm not making any statements about it. I just haven't revisited it in a while. But once you read Rave Master, you're like, ah, this guy has three character designs. <laughs> He's got the main dude, the girl, and the Lancer, and he uses the same designs every time he has those character archetypes in his story. And I just thought that was extremely funny. Um... Uh, I don't know what Warehouse 13 is. I don't know what Log Horizon is. Uh, did not watch Rise of the TMNT. Spectacular Spider-Man. Finally, an actually underrated media hot take I can talk about. Um, Spectacular Spider-Man is really good. I think it is probably one of the best pieces of Spider-Man media, and I say it is probably only topped by Into the Spider-Verse at this point. Um, 
Spectacular Spider-Man is unfortunately one of the shows that was canceled before its time, so it kind of ends on a cliffhanger, but it's got some really good moments in it. Uh, it's got great, great voice work. Uh, Spider-Man is played by Josh Keaton, who's like the archetypical hero voice as far as I'm concerned, which is just great casting. Uh, the, the one thing about it is it's 2D animated and the animation style takes a little bit of getting used to. Everyone's got slightly weird looking eyes and noses, but once you sort of acclimate to it, you're like, oh, this is fine. Um, it's, uh, it does a lot of fun adaptations. It's got a really good version of the Black Suit Spider-Man arc. I've, whenever I use that as an example in a trope talk, that's the cartoon it's from. It's really good. Very fun. Um, I don't remember it having any jarringly dumb episodes even like a lot of these shows i'm like watch it but skip around and if it looks like it's going to be stupid it probably will be but i think spectacular spider-man was just like pretty good all the way through so yeah maybe just sit down and watch that front to back and call it a day <laughs> um let's see uh centaur world centaur world is really weird <laughs> I don't know if it's good. I don't know if it's bad. I watched the whole thing. <laughs> um, the one jarring thing about it is that the musical numbers are incredible. Like, really, really good. Um, so I got no idea. I don't know why... Uh, I don't know why it's like that. <laughs> um, the plot is like... Again, it, Central World is very unapologetic about what it is. And I respect it for that. But I don't know if it hit my brain at quite the right angle to really make maximum impact. Uh, but the musical numbers are incredible. That is a show that I do recommend, like, looking up the songs without context. And if you're curious about the context, maybe watch the show. But also, you'll be fine. Um, <laughs> I have the same opinion towards Tangled the Animated Series. <laughs> Another show with incredibly good music in it. Like, really good Broadway-level stuff from Broadway-level singers. And then the like the actual plot of the show <laughs> that connects you from point A to point B is bad. <laughs> it feels like it was being written by two different teams of people and they didn't talk to each other. Uh, so I, that's a show where I recommend looking up the musical numbers and being like, wow, this is an incredibly powerful villain song. I would love to know the context for this or maybe just imagine what it could be and then just imagine what it could be. It'll probably be better than what they did in the show. <laughs> Um, let's see. Haven't watched Psych, but I have been meaning to. I've heard good things about it. Um, let's see. Clone Wars, also fun. Well, okay. The, the 2D animated Clone Wars is good all the way through, basically, uh, with, like, one slightly dumb exception. The 3D animated Clone Wars is overall quite good, but on an episode-to-episode -episode basis is very hit or miss. Um, and again, it's kind of like, you know, you can look up, like, watch recommendations and like just lists of best episodes or specific arcs when i watched through it like most recently what i did was i just watched the episodes with darth maul in it and that was objectively the right choice because those are probably the best the show ever gets um and then you get some dumb episodes where it's like we need to contrive a reason why anakin doesn't have his lightsaber this episode <laughs> so he gives it to padme as like a demonstration of his love even though she doesn't want it <laughs> Whatever, it's dumb. It's fine. It doesn't need to be good all the way through. Um, let's see. Haven't watched Orphan Black. Heard good things about it, I think. I think I tried watching Glitch Text, and I just couldn't quite get into the first episode, but I could probably give it another shot. Oh, boy. Oh, my God, Warcraft the movie. <laughs> I remember Warcraft the movie. The problem is, I am not a World of Warcraft person. I think I played it for, like, three days, and that was it. Uh, I never understood it. I never got the lore. Haven't visited it in, like, 15 years. And then I watched the Warcraft movie, and I was like, oh, yeah, this isn't good. <laughs> it might be better if you know the Warcraft lore, but it did not give me enough context to know what was going on. It doesn't really work as its own self-contained story. It felt like it was being written by people who were very immersed in the original lore, and that's, like, a good kind of problem to have. But it meant that they basically had a blind spot for how the story would look to anybody else. Um, because from that perspective, the movie looks like it plants things and never pays it off. Looks like it establishes mysteries and then doesn't resolve them. Starts character arcs that never finish. Because it's like a prequel to the game setting. 
and that's it. So you watch the movie and you're like, oh, I can't wait for this to start making sense. And then the movie ends. So that was cool. Um, <sighs> let's see. Uh, okay. Of course I haven't watched Morbius, guys. True Morb heads don't watch Morbius, okay? <laughs> also, I've heard nothing about it that makes me want to see it. And everything that makes me want to make it crash and burn because that would be hilarious. Um, let's see. Did not watch through A Crown of Candy solely because A Crown of Candy is based on Game of Thrones and that means it was going to be a downer and I'm just kind of not about that. Well, okay, I am about that. I'm currently watching through the EXU Calamity mini campaign, which is like, you know, you start it and you're like, everyone and everything I'm seeing here is turbo fucked by the end of this. But Crown of Candy, I think because the ending isn't a foregone conclusion, it just stressed me out too much. Oh, I'm sorry. For context, guys... <laughs> A Crown of Candy is, I believe, the third campaign run by Dimension 20, which is College Humor's D&D actual play campaign series. The first series was Fantasy High. The second was Unsleeping City, which I really liked and very much recommend. The third one, I believe, was A Crown of Candy, which is like, what if Candyland had the inner political workings of Game of Thrones? Which means there's betrayal aplenty, lots of PCs die and they have to bring in their secondary characters, there's a lot of pretty serious inter-character conflict, but also everyone is candy. <laughs> or like, carrot men, or bottles of milk. I don't know, it's, it's very funny. It's just, sometimes, this is personal taste, I like a lot of my media to be tonally and aesthetically simple and consistent. So like, I really liked the Lego Batman movie, but there were times when I was watching like the really dramatic moments and I was like, they're fucking Legos, man. <laughs> so like, it sort of pulled me out of it. It's like I'd probably like this moment more if they weren't Legos. Um, that's not really a problem I had when I was for the clips I've seen from Lego Monkey Kid because among other things, it's 2D animated. There's a lot of flexibility, and you can just kind of look at it as like a simplified art style rather than that's a Lego minifig having a really emotional moment right now. <laughs> um, but with Crown of Candy, it's like if I'm about to watch a character who I care deeply about die tragically. I probably don't want them to be a chocolate bunny at the time. <laughs> like, it's just me, you know? It's just my personal preference. Um, oh, let's see. Didn't watch Black Lagoon. Have not watched Has Been Hotel. Uh, I've heard stuff about it. Uh, we have talked about Treasure Planet. It's good. Everybody should watch it. Uh, I've, I've gone on record talking about why Columbo is good. Uh, everybody should watch it. Also, if you're not sure about Columbo, uh, there is a blog I recommend called Columbo File, where they just do, like, episode by episode detailed breakdowns and reviews of every episode, which is useful because Columbo is mostly good, but some of it is really bad. <laughs> um, and, uh, especially, okay, so the first seven seasons were, like, kind of a unit, and then there was, like, a ten-year break, and then they came back. For, like, new sexy Columbo for a new generation. I mean, it was the same. It was still Peter Falk playing him. But, like, there's, like, I... There was a definite effort to make it more sexy for the new generation. <laughs> um, not Columbo himself, but a lot of, like, the people he deals with while he's solving his murders. There's, like, oh, this one's a sex therapist. That's cool. Definitely wouldn't have done that in, like, the 70s. Um... But yeah, individual episodes of Columbo are good, and even the bad episodes of Columbo are still fun. Like, usually they're not distractingly bad, although there's a, there's a couple where, like, the gotcha that they use to get the bad guy is, like, actually bad, and that's a real bummer, because it's, like, all that buildup, and you, you use the fact that the guy basically confessed for no reason to get him to confess. <laughs> anyway... Uh, but yes, I do recommend Columbo. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it is a little difficult to just sort of... I often put it on in the background with the explicit understanding that this means I will not appreciate it as much as I should if I pay attention. Because a lot of it is about noticing the little details that don't add up and like the little things that the, the killer misses when they're covering their tracks. And if you're not paying attention, you're going to be just as baffled as everybody else when Columbo runs into it, which is fine. They're like an hour and a half of nice, comforting, chill stuff. They're great background music while I work. But also... They're just really fun when you do pay attention, so. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I'm seeing Stand Still, Stay Silent get brought up. Uh, I, I'll be honest, that is a webcomic that, like, I was super on board with for the first arc, 
and then I kind of didn't know where it was going with the second arc, and then it ended, and I still didn't really know what was going, so I didn't really read back through it to see what was up, but I did really like that beginning stuff. I loved the premise. I thought it was really interesting. Um, let's see. Hang on. There was one I saw that I was noticing. Transformers Prime. Uh, I've talked about that one before. Uh, I've mentioned I was not really a Transformers person. I never watched Beast Wars. I've only seen one of the Bayformers movies and also Bumblebee. Uh, so Transformers Prime is the only piece of Transformers media that I've actually watched, like, most of. And it's good. That one's pretty much good front to back. Uh, it's... I've seen it described as, like, if the Bayformers movies were, like, a TV show and good. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but they are good, so who knows. Uh, and they also do that thing I like where it's, like, this is a fun child cartoon premise. And then they're sometimes like, hey, we're going to dip into deep existential crushing horror for this episode. And it's like, heck yeah. Uh, let's see. I don't know what Chainsaw Man is. don't know what El Tigre is. Uh, I think I read the comic for Persepolis, but I didn't watch the movie. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I don't think I've ever watched any of the Spy Kids movies. I can feel Indigo disowning me from here. Uh, like, I know about them. I just didn't really get a chance to watch them when I was the target audience age, and I haven't really felt the need to revisit them since. Um, oh, Megamind is really good, but is it really underrated? I feel like everybody knows Megamind is good at this point. Um, that Sonic Boom better be about the show and not the game. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna take this opportunity to drink the second half of my tiny, tiny cup of tea. All right, you can't fool me. I've seen it in chat. Danny Phantom is not underrated. Everyone and their grandma watched it when it came out. Lil Nas X has gone on record that that was part of his sexual awakening. It's not underrated. Everyone knows it slaps. Uh, okay. BBC Merlin, I have not watched. A uh, friend of mine tried to get me into it, <laughs> and her way of getting me into it was saying, now seasons one through three aren't good. Season four is bad. And season five isn't great. And I'm like, so what part do you want me to watch? <laughs> so I never watched it. Um, let's see. You're not going to get me to say that Legend of Korra is underrated. Legend of Korra is a tire fire until season three, and that wasn't enough to save it in my eyes. Um, I don't know what MP Force is, so you can stop putting it in chat. <laughs> Uh, ooh, Every Frame a Painting. That is a YouTube channel that I wish was still active. It's, it's really good. The, uh, the, the guy who ran it did basically just really in-depth, very insightful video essays about certain elements of filmmaking and cinematography, and I, I found them extremely educational. Um, one of my favorite videos of his is about, um, I want to say Jackie Chan's style of physical action comedy. Uh, which is very good. I revisited it to prep for a, a video that's coming up later. Um, anyway, yeah, so definitely recommend that one. Lupin the Third is interesting. Uh, Lupin the Third is not so much a series as it is a franchise, because there's like a dozen different Lupin the Third movies, and most of them are done by completely different people. Uh, and some of them are really good. Uh, and some of them are kind of weird. Uh, they did... What I know about them from, one of the first things I saw from them was the Lupin the Third movie that the Studio Ghibli team did before they were Studio Ghibli, uh, which is Castle of Cagliostro. Um, and it's good. It's cool. It's not very indicative of the tone of Lupin the Third, but it is quite good. Uh, and they did a recent 3D animated one that has... Well, I used a lot of it as an example in the Ancient Super Weapons video because it has an ancient super weapon in it, and it has... Uh, Big castle in the sky energy, and um, it's pretty fun. Yeah, so it's it's just a fun premise. I like it. Uh, hmm. I don't think Berserk constitutes an underrated piece of media. I think Berserk is one of the most talked about manga made in the last 20 years. Uh, oh, criminy guys, you gotta... 
I have not seen the original Helsing anime. Uh, I have not had great experiences with anime that are based on manga before the manga are done. I've only ever seen them be kind of weird and bad. <laughs> so, uh, and I liked Helsing Ultimate. Uh, well, okay. I liked Helsing Ultimate Abridged, and then I watched Helsing Ultimate, and I was like, that's pretty good. Very dark. And then I was fine. I didn't really need to feel the need to rewatch it. Um... Jeez, guys, you can't just throw things at me. I want to see some thoughts on what's going on. Uh, I have not seen Stargate, but I did watch some of Stargate Atlantis. Uh, and I liked it. It's uh, <laughs> It's got some fun moments. Uh, it's got Jason Momoa as, like, the, the dickhead Lancer character, like, before he was really well-known for other stuff, and there's some really fun moments with him. Um... Oh, no. Chat's going even faster. Why did I ask you guys for thoughts on things? Um, haven't watched Ancient Magus Bride. Oh, boy. Uh, haven't watched Venture Bros. <sighs> haven't watched Tron Uprising. I've already talked about Symbionic Titan. Oh, boy, guys. Uh, Star Wars Rebels. That's the one that's like the Clone Wars sequel with Space Aladdin, right? You can probably guess I haven't watched it. Um... I think I tried. I must have tried, because I watched Clone Wars and really liked it and wanted there to be more, and then I wasn't really happy with anything we got, but it was fine. Uh, but I did not watch Rebels. Uh, <laughs> the Adventures of Tintin? Do you mean the comic series or the movie? Because I did read the comic series. I'm pretty sure a lot of it hasn't aged well, but it was very formative for me when I was young. Uh, and I did like the movie... With the exception that it was a little bit uncanny valley. Like, the animation in it was incredibly impressive. Again, from a technical standpoint, there's a really impressive, just, like, long take in it. And you'd think that would be easier in an animated medium. But if anything, it's more complicated. Uh, but it's like, everyone looks, like, photorealistically textured. But they're still kind of proportioned like cartoon characters. And that's a little weird for me. Um... Oh, boy. Uh, Narbonic and or Skin Horse. I've actually read both of those webcomics. Uh, I think they are fun. They're sort of harken back to, like, old-school four-panel, uh, like, newspaper comics. And I think they're cute. Narbonic especially had a, what I remember to be a surprisingly compelling just sub-story about mad science and stuff like that. Or sub-story. I think that was the entire plot, but you know what I mean. Oh, boy. All right. Everyone's got to slow down a little. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what the Horizon Manwa is, so that can stop cluttering up chat. I have not watched Totally Spies. Everything I have heard about Totally Spies makes me think I shouldn't watch Totally Spies. <laughs> because I'm not a huge fan of most fetishes on the internet, and as I understand, Totally Spies covers all of them. Uh, oh, have we got Asterix the Gaul? Yes, I also read a lot of the Asterix comics. They also haven't aged great, but they had some really funny stuff in them. Oh, uh, boy. Uh, wait, is that the Dark Knight trilogy I see? Do I get to talk about the Dark Knight Rises? Okay, yeah, that's not... I'm not calling that underrated. But we can have some hot takes about it if we want. Um, I... Here's the thing. I didn't watch the Nolan Batman trilogy when it came out. I was in middle school, I knew a bunch of people who watched it, and they would not stop talking about how amazing they were. Uh, I just didn't get a chance to watch them. And then later, I did watch them. And, uh, oh boy. Well, uh, I see why people liked him so much. <laughs> I've never seen a superhero movie more embarrassed to be a superhero movie than Batman Begins. It's trying so hard to be, like, better than its premise. Because there's no way to make the premise of Batman, like, not a little bit dumb or at least committed to the bit but like at no point in those movies do you really get the impression that bruce wayne wants to be batman you get the impression that he wants to be a super cool ninja and he just happens to dress up like a bat all right bud i see you in chat you're getting you're getting smacky okay <laughs> you gotta knock that off all right we're good Anyway, so, as I was saying, uh, 
the Nolan Batman trilogy has trouble right out the gate because Christopher Nolan didn't like superheroes at the time. Like he's, I think he's said this, like by the time they made the Dark Knight Rises, he'd actually read some Batman comics. It was like, oh, there's some cool shit in there, which is why that movie is more comic booky. Like we got to autopilot this nuke out of the city is full comic book. I mean, come on. Um, but Christopher Nolan just clearly didn't like superheroes and that's fine. Like not everybody has to like superheroes. I just don't know why they keep giving movies to people who don't like superheroes to make movies about superheroes <laughs> because they did the same thing with Zack Snyder. <laughs> like here's the thing. I really liked the Snyder cut of Justice League. I think I liked it more than some like people who made video essays about how much they liked it because I was just so relieved that it was good. And I thought it was really interesting to compare it to the Whedon cut. But like Christopher Nolan and Zack Snyder both clearly do not like superheroes for the reasons that most people like superheroes. And that is okay. Everyone has different tastes. Nobody has to like a billionaire dressing up like a bat to punch crime. It's dumb. We know, but like, there are so many people who like those characters for the reasons those characters are intended to be liked. And those people could make the movie instead. And it's like, with Snyder, the fact that they started him with Superman is like, how unfair can you get to the poor guy? If he doesn't like Batman for the reasons that people like Batman, he's not even going to understand Superman. And that's demonstrably what happened. <laughs> like... I think that Henry Cavill gives a great performance in those movies, but the character he's playing ain't any Clark Kent I'm familiar with. And that's, again, there's nothing wrong with Zack Snyder not getting Superman and not liking Superman. There are so many people who are in the same boat. It's fine. I just don't understand why they kept giving him Superman movies to make. <laughs> and Christopher Nolan is the same way with Batman. He didn't want to write a, a story about Batman. He wanted to write about a super cool billionaire ninja who punches bad guys and has no accountability to anybody. That's not really Batman so much. Um, and Zack Snyder wanted to make a movie about, hey, what if, like, a person was also, like, a god and maybe we didn't know how much of a person he was? That would be cool. And there's parts of that I like. I One of my favorite bits in the Snyder Cut is after Superman comes back and he's all pet cemetery. And he's, like, not talking through the entire fight. And then when he and Lois land on the farm, she says, he, he says, this is home. And she says, you spoke. And he asks, did I not before? And it's just, like, such a great little moment of just pure inhuman confusion. And I think that's interesting. It's not any version of Clark Kent I like or have seen anywhere else. But it's an interesting character. And I thought that it, by that movie... Snyder at least knew what he was doing with that character. I mean, he's more Miracle Man than Superman, and that's okay. Again, that's an interesting character. I just don't know why they keep giving him Superman movies. <laughs> and Christopher Nolan feels the same way with Batman. And you can tell, because in the first one, it's like, this is the Batman origin. And in the second one, it's like, I'm never going to be Batman again. And it's like, good job, you clocked in maybe a year as society's most beloved superhero. And then in the third one, they're like, just kidding, Batman is back. No, just kidding, he's, he's gone again. And it's like, all right. Good work, team. We got almost no Batman in these Batman movies. Part of the reason I liked the Batman so much is that we get so much goddamn Batman in it. Like, you kind of get the impression that Bruce Wayne doesn't exist. Not really. Not yet. Like, like he hasn't figured out how to be a person after the loss of his parents. He's, he's so much Batman that the one time we see him having to be Bruce Wayne, he seems completely lost and confused and scared. I mean, like, he's not scared. Like, when they have the bomb scare, like he's the only person in the entire church who doesn't flinch. It's a great moment. But he just seems so anxious and uncomfortable in his own skin when he's not in the bat suit. And I think that's an incredible portrayal of this character of like, he's Batman, yeah, but he's not really fully Batman yet. And I thought it was great. I thought it was really interesting. In part because it was one of the only Batman movies I've ever seen that wasn't embarrassed to be about Batman. <laughs> a lot of these other ones are like, no, no, he's just Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne is a totally normal, chill guy. He just sometimes dresses up in a ninja costume and punches the disenfranchised. And it's like, all right, cool. You don't, I don't know. I don't want to be all, oh, a bunch of fake geeks. But like, 
there's been so many writers who've written good Batman stories and good Superman stories. Maybe you could ask one of them what makes the character tick. <sighs> I realize that's not an underrated media take. That's an overrated media take. But I, I just really had to get that out of my system when Blue and Indigo weren't here to stop me. <laughs> You guys don't know how many times I've started that rant on the podcast and had to stop. Um, huh, boy. Uh, let's see. Lego Batman was, before the Batman, one of my favorite versions of Batman, with the caveat that he's not a serious Batman. He's a joke character. Like, that's why they made the character work. It's like... This is a Batman that is like the caricature of Batman. And then the Lego Batman movie was like, but what if we brought up the whole dead family serious trauma thing? Like, what if we did that in a Lego movie? And it's like, I mean, you could. You sure could. So that's cool. Um, and of course, the best version is in the DC animated universe. And, you know, I'm a big fan of old Bruce Wayne from Batman Beyond, even though it kind of means that the Batman I like ended up sad and alone which makes me sad but batman beyond is really good so i'll take it anyway um let's see i have read kill six billion demons uh it's very interesting it's a very unique comic um and the guy who makes it i think is one of the developers on lancer the uh the robot like the mecha ttrpg which i haven't played but i've heard really good things about uh, the art in Kill Six Billion Demons is incredible. It's probably one of the best illustrated comics, especially web comics, like I've ever seen. Um, really not afraid to shake up the status quo in ways that I personally find quite upsetting, but like I really respect it. So, if you're okay with some pretty crazy weird shit, I recommend I recommend Kill Six Billion Demons. There's a lot of cool stuff there. Um, let's see. Haven't watched Godzilla the animated series. I have read Order of the Stick. Order of the Stick is one of a number of webcomics that I think are very interesting because of that thing I was talking about earlier in the stream uh, with um, basically the way that nerd and geek culture has evolved over the last several decades. Because there were a lot of comics that started off being featured in Dragon Magazine. Uh, there were just comic artists that would like make little one-page comics about like the, the wacky adventures of adventuring parties in D&D. And they'd go in Dragon Magazine, and then the internet kind of fired up, and a lot of those people started putting those comics online. The first of those comics that I was aware of, um, excuse me, was called Nodwick. Uh, and it was about a henchman named Nodwick. Uh, he was a, a short guy whose job was to carry all the loot that the brutish warrior and metagaming wizard and completely naive cleric picked up during their dungeon crawls. Uh, and then it kind of turned into a much longer saga thing. And the guy who makes it, Aaron Williams, uh, does a bunch of other comics, too. He also does uh, Full Frontal Nerdity, which is basically a just a table of people who play TTRPGs together and their hijinks. Uh, and a comic called PS238, which I really like, which is about uh, basically a middle school for kids superheroes and the one normal kid who attends it and... How his life has been going recently. <laughs> the one thing I will say that bums me out about PS238 is I think in the last year, it has updated like maybe five times. And that makes me very sad because it's a really fun comic. Um, but Order of the Stick, as far as I can recall, started off similarly. It uh, had a very simple like stick figure style and it was an adventuring party having wacky D&D adventures. And then it also kind of kicked off and started having a plot of its own. Uh, and it's sort of gotten more immersed in its own setting over time. Like, it always has a sort of, like, meta twist to it. Like, the characters are aware to a certain extent of the rules of the world that they inhabit, of, like, what things they do, buff what stats and stuff like that. Uh, but a lot of that meta humor was, like, what it leaned on really heavily early on and has since kind of shifted. Like, there's there's a major part in, like, the first major boss fight where they're like oh you, you'll never hit that target you'll need to roll a critical hit and it'll be like don't worry she'll roll it and then she does and i was like okay hold on wait <laughs> the, the diegesis of this universe confuses me um but uh anyway yeah uh, it has since gone 
much farther beyond that. Uh, it's got a very interesting meta narrative going. It's got like more than a thousand pages in the archive, and I do recommend just clicking through and reading it because it's a lot of fun. It also has an incredibly irregular upload schedule, but that is okay. That's the price you pay for classic web comics, I guess. Oh boy. Uh, but yes, uh, I just think that from a meta perspective, the um, the the way that especially the TTRPG community has evolved in the last like few decades, especially recently with the advent of things like Critical Role and Actual Play podcasts in general, it's just really interesting seeing this otherwise very niche hobby suddenly develop mainstream appeal as people around the world are able to see like, oh, that's what you guys are always going on about. And I just think it's really interesting. <laughs> uh, let's see. Wolfwalkers. Wolfwalkers is genuinely very underrated. More people should watch it. Everything that animation studio does is great. They also did um, Secret of Kells and Song of the Sea. Of those, I think Wolfwalkers is the one I like the most. Um... Secret of Kells feels a little bit like... Secret of Kells and Song of the Sea, I worry I maybe didn't get the point of when I watched them, to kind of explain. It's like, they have plots, but it is not really shaped like any plots I'm personally very familiar with. But Wolfwalkers has a much more standard rhythm, uh, much more like clear beginning, middle, end, you know, continuous threat, antagonist, stuff like that. Whereas uh, Secret of Kells, as I recall, the main antagonist is like the ever-present threat of Vikings. And Song of the Sea, I think the threat is like familial dysfunction or something. But Wolfwalkers is fantastic, very much recommended. I used it as an example in the uh, Halloween Werewolves video because it's really good. Um, let's see. I tr I've read a little bit of Wayne Family Adventures. I guess my hot take is... I don't like it as much as everybody else, um, which is rare for me. Normally, I am, well, I did just complain nonstop about the Nolan Batman trilogy, an otherwise completely beloved series of movies. Uh, I, I don't really know how to say this in a way that doesn't make me sound kind of evil, but the, the problem I have with Wayne Family Adventures is that nothing bad happens in it. Uh, and I, I think the thing is, like, it's like, I don't really like it when you get Batman stories that are just constant grimdark misery and status quo disruption like hey we got to take dick grayson the one shining beacon of light in the dc universe and we're gonna mess him up again or like hey what if we what if we took like the batman catwoman romance and we ripped it away from you that would be cool uh so like i don't like that i don't like when it's just grimdark nonstop misery but it's like wayne family adventures is just like frosting and no cake <laughs> it's it's like it's just the sweet stuff with nothing to really hold it together um, and I've talked elsewhere in this stream about how I like it when you have shows and stories that can, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> that can kind of go from, like, very emotional highs to very emotional lows, uh, and that's because each one of those, like, it really makes the other one stand out more. Like, if everything is miserable all the time, and then you want to do a story that's a real gut punch, like... How are you going to make that happen? Everyone's already miserable all the time. And then in the meantime, if everything is always happy and fluffy and conflict-free, like, how are you going to show a real high moment? You, you really can't. Which is why it's cool to have these stories where you have, like, fluffy episodes where fun stuff, it's like, oh, we're just going to have, like, a birthday party for the team. That'll be fun. And then it's like, hey, you know what would be really cool? Psychological torment. <laughs> um, and one of the shows that I remember being impressed with doing this for the first time was uh, Teen Titans, actually. Not not Go, but, like, the original. Because you'd get episodes where it's like, uh-oh, the bad guy's holding the city hostage unless Robin takes his daughter to prom. And then you'd have episodes where it's like, <laughs> you have episodes like Haunted, or the entirety of the Trigon arc. And it's like, wow, this got fucking crazy. <laughs> and I liked that. I liked that you never really knew what you were going to get when an episode started. Because sometimes it would be nice and chill, and sometimes it would be dumb as hell, and sometimes it would be really, really startlingly dark and, like, emotional. Um, and the problem I have with Wayne Family Adventures is nothing is going to happen. <laughs> it's like we're getting these characters having the kinds of fun, sweet interactions I wish we got in the comics, but they're happening completely divorced of the context of the comics. So, like, it never really feels like they're existing in the same space. You know, we're not getting 
the impact of, oh, like this character, like they went through something really bad, but now we're going to have like a sweet moment with the family where they're all hanging out and having a great time. Or like, oh, we had that sweet moment, but now, oh no, a bad guy has shown up and disrupted the status quo. And because I'm invested in the status quo, I want them to get back there and solve this problem. You're just kind of getting them in two completely separate tracks. And I just, you know, it seems cute and fluffy and I respect that it exists and it's very cool that it, it does exist. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I just, <laughs> I'm normally a big fan of eating frosting without the cake, but in this specific case, I'll make an exception. Ay, ay, ay. Um, uh, let's see. Huh. <sighs> More webcomics. There are a lot of underrated webcomics, guys. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Oh, I recommend Sleepless Domain. Uh, we were talking about Magical Girl stuff earlier. Sleepless Domain is very interesting. I'm, I'm very curious about the Magical Girl mystery. It's slowly starting to unfold. So I, I do recommend that. Big trigger warning on the first... Uh, excuse me, chapter or two. Uh, that's about as low as it ever goes, but it goes really low. Um, oh my god, Everything Everywhere All at Once is so good. Everybody should watch it. I think the world would genuinely be a better place if everybody watched that movie. <laughs> Everything Everywhere All at Once is so buck wild. I don't know how it plays if you don't have ADHD, <laughs> but I felt it rewiring my brain chemistry when I watched it, and it was so good. Uh, I love how the whole thing is basically a rolling existential crisis about whether to embrace a fundamentally nihilistic worldview from an optimistic perspective or a pessimistic one. Uh, the, uh, the everything bagel versus the googly eye, if, if you will. Um, but the idea that like, oh yeah, sure, maybe on a cosmic scale nothing matters, but we can always, always choose to be kind is like, oh my god, that is literally... The only moral I ever need in any story from now on. <laughs> uh, it's just such a good movie. Everybody should watch it. It's so cool. Um, let's see. I Okay, Doom Patrol is interesting. I tried watching it, uh, and I think I just kind of slid off the wagon. I remember liking it fine. Um... I, uh, I thought it was cool that Brendan Fraser was in it. I was glad that he was acting, acting again. Um, <laughs> my dad was a big fan that it existed. I don't know if he's still watching it, but like, as mentioned, my, my parents are like old school nerds. Uh, my mom was like the old school AD and D nerd. And I mean, so was my dad, obviously. Uh, but my dad is like the old school comic fan. Uh, <laughs> and he has some strong opinions about recent developments in comic history, which I think is pretty fun. Uh, but he was very excited about there being a Doom Patrol show because it's like, oh my god, Doom Patrol of all things? A series that I liked that I thought nobody else in the world appreciated? Heck yeah! So, anyway, um, ooh, finally an excuse to bring up Slayers again. <laughs> um, Slayers is an interesting anime experience. It's like, I want to say 90s, maybe even early 90s, uh, at least the, the early seasons, uh, it's like if someone took early D&D &D and turned it into an anime uh, with the world's most overpowered protagonists. And I think my affection for it is maybe a little bit out of proportion with how good the show actually is. This is a risk of when you watch stuff when you're in like a heightened brain state. I think I maybe watched that the first time when I was again in a finals week and I really needed something to do with my brain. And I think it just kind of permanently stuck it into like a place of high honor in my head. Um... But I honestly just really like the characters in that show. Uh, because they sort of do this thing where everybody is overpowered, which anyone who has read my webcomic probably knows I am a, a big fan of that trope. Um, and that means that, like, the only threats that the show can throw at them are, like, primordial gods and eldritch abominations from outside the universe. Uh... Because if it's just, like, normal bad guys, they just win. Uh, and it's got a really nice mix of, like, you got... Well, again, uh, in terms of stories that, like, hit a good balance between silly stuff and really serious stuff. Like, the comic relief stuff in Slayers gets pretty absurd. And then, like, the climax of the, the season can be... 
That's right, main character. I have all your friends literally dead, and now I have their souls trapped in this crystal that I'm going to break unless you cast a spell that will literally destroy the entire world. And I'm like, how do we get here from, like, the wacky fish person romance episode? <laughs> um, so I really appreciate that. Uh, it's also one of those shows that has, like, most of the characters have, like, not very angsty backstories, and then there's one character who has the world's most dark and angsty backstory, and he's just kind of, like, chill about it most of the time, but sometimes he's really not about it. And I just really like that. Obviously, he's the Lancer of the group. It's great. Um, and it's fun because uh, each season is pretty self-contained. Uh, and it it's also, they did this thing with Sailor Moon, too. It's like each season is named something different for some reason. So it's like, you got Sailor Moon, and they got, like, Sailor Moon R, and, like... Sailor Moon, something else. And with Slayers, it's like you got Slayers, and then you got Slayers next, and then you got Slayers Futures. I don't remember. Whatever. So it's a little bit confusing, but it is good. Uh, <laughs> but that one I recommend you watched and you you watch uh, subbed, not dubbed, because no shade on any of those people. It was early days. Nobody knew any better. <laughs> but the dub really hurts me to watch. Um, let's see. <sighs> okay, Batman the Animated Series is not underrated. Come on. it That's why we had a DC Animated Universe. <laughs> okay. um, I actually watched Wolf Children once because I knew it was going to make me really sad. Uh, it's, like, fine. Uh, I mean, it's it's sad. <laughs> it's another story where I thought maybe I didn't really get the point of it. This is true of a lot of things. I think critically about a lot of media, but not, I think, in the same directions that I am maybe supposed to. Uh, let's see. Oh, no. I slowed down for a second and the chat went crazy. Um, I have not watched Batman the Brave and the Bold. I saw clips from it and, like, the art style and some of, the like, the vocal deliveries just kind of threw me off. It felt like a joke series. Uh... I still don't know anything about it, so who knows. Um, Land of the Lustrous. I, okay. <laughs> I don't know where it's going. So Land of the Lustrous is a manga and I believe also a, an anime. Is it? Is it one of the anime where they're sort of trying to like 3D animate it to see if that makes it easier? Uh, well, the premise is it's like a bunch of beautiful, like androgynous gemstone people on a on a world that is like earth but completely suspiciously depopulated uh and they're at war with the people of the moon and then everything just gets weirder <laughs> um and it's doing interesting things but i don't think i'll be able to tell if it's good or not until it's over and also it has been a relentless shitstorm of just bad horrible things happening to the main character non-stop since about like chapter four <laughs> and that kind of makes me not want to keep reading it so i don't know what's been happening recently um okay uh let's see all oh, right yeah and also the protagonist like went through a becoming the villain arc that i don't know didn't really work for me. Uh, I think it's like, I'd like this show better or the manga better if I got the impression that any of the characters actually liked each other as people, but everyone is such a weird, like, inhuman alien being that the only emotions they seem to experience are existential angst and dread. And I just have that, that, that just, I just find that difficult to click into, you know? Like, no shade. I'm sure somebody out there likes it. I just don't really get it. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Disney's Hunchback is not underrated. <laughs> Come on, guys. <sighs> I would say The Land of the Lustrous is not Steven Universe, but better. I would say it is a suspiciously similar premise to Steven Universe and nowhere near as fun. Uh, but that's just me. Um, believe it or not, I've never watched Gurren Logan. I know the memes. That's it. Oh, boy. Um, Marvel's Runaways. I 
I think I started that and I sort of fell off the wagon. I was reading the comic for that for a while and I thought it was pretty interesting. But I think the problem I keep running into whenever I read a long running comic series is I'm always like, I wonder where this is going. And the answer is, uh, nowhere. It's a long running serialized story that swaps writers every 10 issues. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Um, let's see. Vision of Escaflown. Okay, I have tried watching a little bit of Escaflown. Um, the problem I have with it, again, it's a very early anime. The dub is bad. <laughs> That's just how it was back in those days. Uh, I could probably watch it subbed, but I'll be honest, the premise never really grabbed me. It, As far as I know, it's... Uh, it's fairly representative of the uh, early shoujo isekais of the day, um, where an every girl would end up in a magical fantasy world, usually populated by hunky boys. Like, this is, you know, <laughs> this is the subgenre of which I think it's it's not controversial to say that Inuyasha was, like, the breakout winner in this category, because, you know, you also had Fushigi Yugi. Obviously, Escaflown had a big impact, but, like, Inuyasha is the one that people are still talking about, like, now. <laughs> Um, and they all kind of had the same format, and they were all pretty standard romance fare. It's like, oh, you're gonna hang out with a hunky boy with superpowers in a magical fantasy realm. Have fun. Cool. It's like, of those, I'm good. I was obsessed with Inuyasha for like two years, so I'm good. That's, that's all I needed. Um, I don't know what Princess Tutu is. We already talked about Saint Seiya, actually, a little bit. Uh... I know about Psyche K. That's the one with the guy with the little little dealy boppers on his head, right? Um, I've mostly seen people <laughs> doing little cute fan arts with like him hanging out with the girl from Spy X Family because they're both like pink-haired psychics. Um, Kubo and the Two Strings, I have complicated feelings about. Uh, Kubo and the Two Strings, I think, is incredible from a technical standpoint. I think that stop-motion animation is extremely cool and very impressive, especially when it's pulled off well. Um, I don't really get the plot of Kubo and the Two Strings, and I don't think I found the ending particularly satisfying. But it does look very pretty. <laughs> so, uh, huh, let's see. Um, didn't watch Darker Than Black. Wait, maybe I tried watching Darker Than Black. Okay, in that case, I didn't like Darker Than Black enough to watch more of it. Uh, I have not watched Spawn the Animated Series. I didn't know there was one of those, but I did watch Spawn the movie, and it was real bad. <laughs> we explicitly did it as a bad movie night uh, with friends. And, like, up to a certain point, we were like, I mean, it's bad, but, like, it's not awful. And then we got to the finale that takes place in hell, <laughs> and the CGI is just wretched and we were like oh okay i see why this movie is so badly reviewed <laughs> uh let's see oh boy oh boy okay um tenet okay tenet is pretty underrated imo the concept is very interesting and what they do with it is awesome i have not seen tenet i've heard exclusively good things about it from people who like christopher nolan as a director and exclusively neutral to vaguely bad things about it from everybody else. I think Tenet is, like, an interesting concept that they don't seem to have built a plot around. Uh, and I think this is a thing that I've seen in a lot of Nolan movies, because I had a similar feeling towards Interstellar. Uh, which... <laughs> Oh, man. I have a lot of affection for Interstellar for one reason only, and that reason is the 3D model of the black hole. <laughs> I think it was very cool how they just threw a fuck ton of money and processing power at these mathematical equations that have existed for years and years, and I think they should do it more often. <laughs> but that's the only part of Interstellar I just fully uncritically enjoy. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, Harley Quinn. I have not seen the Harley Quinn animated series, but I have a YouTube video recommendation. Let me pull it out of my history real quick. Uh, it is... Okay, yeah. Uh, it just came out like two days ago. It's by uh, Lady Emily, who does, I believe, some editing for Sarah Zed. Uh, and the video 
is called The Evolving Relationship of Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy. Uh, and it's just kind of like a, a breakdown of how that particular relationship is developed from their first dynamic in Batman the Animated Series, the show that created Harley Quinn as a character, all the way up through more recent media. Um, it's a really fun video, fun breakdown, so I do recommend that. Go check it out. It's only got like 20k views, so let's let's show some love. Uh, let's see. What else is happening? Um, <laughs> I have not seen Harley Quinn. Guys, like, I, <laughs> I'm good, all right? Harley Quinn is not a character I've ever been super enamored with. Uh... I also am not super impressed with, like, we're doing a superhero cartoon, but we're going to say fuck sometimes. Woo! It's like, yeah, guys, I read Watchmen too. It's uh, it's it's pretty fine, I guess. Um, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't need to be my flavor to be a good show, and I've heard only good things about it except for... Well, okay. I have heard that it has, like, some jokes in it, that are probably only okay because some of the some of the writing and directing team is Jewish and that makes it okay to joke about some of those things but without that context it's a little bit upsetting anyway it's fine i'm i'm glad the show exists and people are enjoying it um excuse me someone is asking to be put in timeout and i am not one to deny someone their dreams <sighs> okay all right we're back uh, Seven Deadly Sins. I tried watching Seven Deadly Sins. Uh, I think I just kind of slid out of it at some point. I was just like, yeah, this is pretty shonen-y. And then I was like, you know what? I'm not really feeling this. And I can choose not to watch it. And then I didn't. Um, let's see. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. Bleach. Okay, Bleach is not underrated. Are you kidding me? Bleach was, like, one of the three biggest anime in the world for, like, five years running when I was in middle and high school. <laughs> ah, jeez. Uh, ooh. Sorry, that's, a uh, someone brought up something pretty niche. Let me finish this tea real quick. So, what that person brought up was the Superman vs. the Elite animated movie. Um... And if you mostly just watch the DC animated cartoons, you might not know that they do some just, like, just standalone animated movies, often based on limited runs in the comics, uh, which is how I think they did Superman, Batman, Public Enemies. I think that one was similar. Um, so Superman vs. the Elite is a notable movie because <laughs> it features Superman temporarily pretending to be evil. Uh which I find interesting because it strikes a sweet spot between a plot point I hate, Superman is evil now, and a plot point I really like. Superman is a paragon of goodness who will not turn evil, and if he ever does turn evil, it's really bad. Because in Superman the Elite, we get, basically, uh, the premise of that movie is that the bad guys, the Elite, are like, Superman, you're a total weenie. We're the new generation. We're cool and hip, and we don't mind killing people about it. Uh, and we're going to beat you up a lot until you, I don't know, die or admit that we're better or something. Uh, and basically, Superman pretends that he's like, okay, I guess I'll take this seriously. Uh, and he does not kill any of them because he's Superman. He's a good boy. But he does pretend to kill all of them <laughs> convincingly enough that they freak the fuck out. And like... I am just a big fan of the trope where, like, a character who is very, very nice and kind and does not advocate for themselves snaps <laughs> and, uh, kind of terrifies everybody with how scary they are when they're not being nice. Uh, and it's kind of nice getting to see Superman do that for a change. Uh, it's... I, I think I watched the movie because I saw, like, a clip of that happening without context, and I was like, is Superman just straight up murdering these guys? And I watched the movie, and I was like, oh, no, this is better. Anyway, uh, let's see. Excuse me. I don't know what you guys think spamming is going to accomplish. <sighs> okay, we're fine. Um, all right. Uh, I... Oh no, Halo Legends. Is that the one that just came out? The uh the the Paramount live action Halo series? Because uh I was not impressed by it. Uh well okay. That's not true. 
parts of it I thought were very impressive. Uh, I mostly liked that watching the Brian David Gilbert Halo novels video spoiled every major plot twist in the show for me. <laughs> I thought that was very fun. Uh, and I, I quite enjoyed that just watching this random, you know, 30 minute YouTube video of the internet's favorite twink losing his mind, uh, spoiled every major plot twist in this extremely high budget sci-fi show. Um, and it's cool. I didn't even realize I'd like preserve. Oh no. Halo Legends is the anime. Well, I haven't watched that, but we're going to keep talking about Halo the show because I have some grievances. Um, <laughs> and, uh. It's interesting. There's a lot of stuff that I didn't even realize I'd, like, processed from that video. Uh, but there's a bit in, like, I don't know, like, the seventh or sixth episode or something where, like, one of the characters is told, like, oh, centuries ago our family met a visitor from beyond the stars or maybe beyond the universe at this well in the desert. And then she has, like, a vision of that guy talking to this visitor from the stars. And I was like, oh, shit, it's Guilty Spark. <laughs> Why do I know who Guilty Spark is? Um, so that was fun. And of course, the whole like first six episodes are like, oh, if Spartan John 117 ever finds out the truth about his past, we're going to be in trouble. And I was like, is that the thing where you flash cloned him and like kidnapped him? And then like six episodes, and they're like, yeah, we totally flash cloned him and kidnapped him. It's oh, super bad. And I was like, oh, it is that thing. OK, cool. That was like the first part of like the BDG video. So I, I wasn't really expecting it to be such a big deal. Um but I'll tell you why I have stopped watching that show and did not watch the finale. Uh, because <laughs> the show did two things back to back. The first one I would have tolerated. The second, I genuinely don't understand why they did that. And the first one was a sex scene. And again, whatever. The fact that Master Chief Bones in this show is weird... But whatever. I expect nothing less from prestige television. But the thing is, after Master Chief's uh, Master Chief turns this girl from being evil to being a good guy, uh, and she stops trying to kill him, she, uh... <sighs> so she has this little, like, energy blade hidden under her fingernail. Because she was, like, taken by the Covenant when she was little, and then she was, like... She's, like, super pro-Team Covenant now. And they gave her, like, a little energy knife thingy. And she's like, Master Chief's magic dingle-dongle has made me not evil anymore. I'm gonna not kill him. And then she rips off her own fingernail. <laughs> and it takes a while. And there's sound effects. And I nearly fainted just listening to it. Like, I am a pretty sturdy person. I do not pass out as a rule i came real close on this one and i was like all right you know what i was okay with the wildly out of character sex scene i'm not okay with you subjecting me to this and i fully stopped middle of the episode and just did not watch the rest of it or the finale so hopefully it's good <laughs> maybe they'll let us see a halo ring in season two <laughs> I probably won't know. Um, yeah, see? Yeah, chat's freaking the fuck out about it. Yeah, I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. Like, like I know that there's a wide array of phobias of various severities, but, like, bad stuff happening to fingernails is, like, one of the things that almost everybody hates, like, on a very visceral level. So I don't know why they did that after mostly well okay it wasn't like violence free but a lot of it was like tastefully off screen to be fair i wasn't watching like i wasn't looking because god knows i would not be willing to look at that so just having the sounds playing might have been worse for me anyway i don't know why they did that and i don't i don't know why they thought it was a good idea <laughs> but boy it really turned me off for the rest of that series <sighs> okay um all right, let's see. Uh, don't know what Princess Tutu is. Gunner Krig Court is an interesting webcomic uh, that I think is paced a little weirdly. Uh, I Initially, I just thought maybe I didn't get it in places, but I also think that sometimes it just jumps from one thing to another very quickly without really explaining the intervening things. Like There was two of the main character running around for a while, and it was like a plot point that they hated each other. 
And then it was like, wow, ever since the two of you fused into one being, everything's been fine. Yup. And then they're, they're just like, it's, they've never spoken of it again since then. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's a fun webcomic. I follow it a lot. I think it's very cool. Uh, I'm excited to see where it goes. I just think maybe I haven't been paying enough attention to it. Um, <sighs> and I also recommend uh, Daughter of the Lilies, another really good webcomic, with the understanding that it is currently on a year-long hiatus while the creator works on another project. Um, so definitely read through it uh, up to the current point. Uh, but, you know, and, and follow the creator on other stuff. She's very fun. But just, like, be aware it's not going to update anytime soon. Um, let's see. <laughs> yes, chat. Owl House is not underrated. Owl House is just being criminally hurt by its own network, so. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I have not played Dragon Age. I know some people who have. Uh, haven't watched Kamen Rider. Already talked about Witch. Don't think I've watched Mononoke. Uh, oh boy. Uh, let's see. Haven't watched Onyx Equinox, but I have heard only good things about it. Uh, let's see. Warhammer, like like the the minis game. I I've played Warhammer. Well, I played Warhammer 40k and Warhammer. Um, I had a pretty sizable army of Eldar, uh, but I was playing it at the time when the Eldar were criminally under under leveled balance wise, and the only person I could play with was my cousin who had a huge army of orcs and just beat me every time, and I got really tilted about it. And then I kind of just stopped the game because it was eating all of my money. And then they updated it. Now the Eldar are super busted. Not that I would know. I haven't played in a while. But I also had a Warhammer Fantasy army. Not because I liked playing it, but just because I really liked how the minis looked. <laughs> like, like all the Warhammer uh, like minis, like Warhammer 40k minis, especially the Eldar, aren't really super interesting. Um, all the, like ground units are basically the same uh for being a like a species of gorgeous psychic space elves there are no pretty people in those armies <laughs> i don't think the artists know how to sculpt pretty people i'm a connoisseur of pretty people so like i was disappointed but when you have the warhammer fantasy armies there's a lot of gorgeous stuff in there um they have these like <laughs> they have uh like like a the generic, like, human army is, like, knights, but they are so clearly being, like, manipulated by the forces of the Fae. <laughs> like, all their elite units are, like, the uh, the Green Knight and, like, the Lady of the Lake. And I was like, oh, okay, so they're just another puppet in, like, another divine war between gods. That's cool. Um, I do like that in the lore of Warhammer, like, the Warhammer fantasy world is just, like clearly a planet in the warhammer 40k universe that nobody knows has anybody alive on it <laughs> because part of the lore of warhammer fantasy is that there is an open chaos gate on this world <laughs> and in warhammer 40k that basically means all right quarantine the planet everybody on there is dead and it's extra funny because uh the 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 eldar the 40k army one of the main things about them is that uh their gods were decimated and killed by the creation of Slanish, the Chaos God, because the the Eldar were like this super hedonistic magical space empire, but they're also all psychic. So basically all the really nasty sex they were having created a Chaos God, Slanish, who like murdered their way through all the Eldar gods. The funny thing is, the gods of the elves in Warhammer Fantasy are the Eldar gods. <laughs> Which means they're not dead, they're just in witness protection in fantasy land. <laughs> and I just think that's so funny that if the Eldar ever noticed that, like, there's a thriving elf population on this planet and also all their gods are just hiding out there with Groucho glasses, I just think it's so fun. It'll never happen, but, like, I don't know, I think the world building is cute. Ugh, anyway, uh, let's see. Wait, they killed Warhammer Fantasy? What?! That was where all the best minis designs were hiding. How dare they? Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, Stardust. Uh, the, the movie based on the Neil Gaiman story, I want to say. Uh, yeah. Uh, I thought it was really fun. <laughs> Although, um, 
Stardust, I would classify as a simple meal well made in that it is very, very fantasy tropey, but it plays it to the hilt and I have no complaints about it. But I was watching it with friends <laughs> as like a, a movie night and there's a bit where like the heroes end up briefly stranded like on top of a cloud and I derisively said, uh, just watch bunch of sky pirates are going to show up any minute and one of my friends gave me a look because a bunch of sky pirates proceeded to show up <laughs> so like it's not really doing anything super surprising but that's fine you know i like those tropes for a reason it's cute uh let's see um ah promare i have gone on record recommending promare several times i used it as an example in the are we the baddies video a lot because it's really good uh i don't know if it well okay sorry really good it's really fun <laughs> i don't know if promare is actually a good movie i just know i really like it uh it's got a lot of weird shit in it uh but in like the best way it, it plays everything it does to the hilt um it starts from the premise of like some people around the world spontaneously develop crazy pyrokinetic powers and are now an oppressed minority called the Burnish, and our main characters are a bunch of firefighters, by which I mean they wear robot suits and fight fire-slinging pyromaniac terrorists! Woo! And then it gets weirder from there. <laughs> uh, I just like how unapologetic it is. The, like, a major plot point in the movie is that our heroes just randomly stumble on this secret lab with, like, the cyber ghost of, like, the scientist that figured out everything important about the plot, and his giant robot called the Deus Ex Machina <laughs> for them to pilot to fight the bad guy. And uh, it's really fun. I had a great time. And I know Indigo's not watching this stream, so I can say right out that I still don't know what Indigo's grievance about Promare is, but one of these days I'm going to make her watch it from Movie Struck, and then I'll find out for sure. Uh, let's see. I actually think Promare is on HBO Max. Um, I think. So check it out. Um, let's see. Uh, haven't watched B-Stars. Uh, how dare you compare it to Iron Man 3. <laughs> Promare is significantly more fun than Iron Man 3. Uh, let's see. Already talked about Dragon Force. Oh, Cells at Work. That's a name I haven't heard in a while. It's, um, fun, I think. Uh, I th like, I think I watched it and then I basically got the gimmick and then I stopped watching it. Just because it was like, yeah, that's about what I expected. Um, I've talked before about how fun Exalted is, or at least, you know, in theory. Uh, I think it would be really cool if... <laughs> I, I think it would be fun if Exalted was sort of known to the degree that a lot of other TTRPGs are. Like, what we really need is for someone to bite the bullet and do an actual play podcast for Exalted. Because then everyone would realize that it's basically like what happens if you, like slam 30 boxes of Pocky and then binge watch all of Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball at the same time <laughs> and Gundam. And then you're like, what if we made a game system for all of that? So yeah, everybody should look up Exalted. Uh, it's fun and cool and absolute bullshit in the best possible way. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, Treasure Planet keeps getting brought up. Everyone agrees it's underrated. I think that means at some point it just loops back around to just being good and well-liked. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm just looking at the, the chat. Uh, we're starting to get to the point where people are like, Stormhawk, Cyber 6, and it's like, guys, guys, it's earlier in the VOD, don't worry. As soon as this finishes processing... It'll be up and available for everybody to watch. Um, okay, so I, I mentioned earlier that Green Lantern, the animated series, is really good and underrated, but I actually didn't explain anything about its deal. So I'm going to do that now because I just saw it get brought up again. Um, basically, <laughs> Green Lantern, the animated series, only exists so that they can do a really cute, complicated romance between two original characters. <laughs> Everything else is just like the plausible deniability for why this show can happen. Uh, so nominally, the main character is Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, uh, and his buddy, Kilowog, also a Green Lantern. Uh, <laughs> but let's be real. The actual main character of that show is basically Razor. <laughs> 
he is in my head the platonic ideal of a lancer and that is saying something uh he is a red lantern of course for those of you who aren't aware in green lantern all the lantern colors have associated emotions and things so green lantern is the emotion of willpower which isn't an emotion but that's okay uh yellow is fear orange is greed I'll give you three guesses what red is. <laughs> Obviously, it is anger. Uh, blue is hope. Purple I th or violet is love, I think. And uh, they also had a series or a, like, a, like a mini special event called Blackest Night where they brought up black lanterns, which are zombies, and white lanterns, which are superior to all other colors. <laughs> well, let's not look at that too hard. Um... Anyway, uh, Green Lantern, the animated series, uh, starts with Hal Jordan and Kilowog going off into, like, this crazy far-off sector of space to fight all the Red Lanterns, and in the process, they end up picking up Razor. He's an edgy Red Lantern with a tragic past, and he does bad stuff, but he kind of feels bad about it, and, uh, it's, it's very cool. Basically, initially, they're like, all right, we stopped you from blowing up this planet or whatever, but a Green Lantern sacrificed himself in the process and we're pretty pissed, so we're going to arrest you and take you to space prison. And they take him to space prison. But then they find out that space prison is not being ethically managed. <laughs> it is actually being run by man-eating spider people who, uh, like... <laughs> okay. You know, sometimes you see a plot point in a story and you're like, this was specifically designed for angsty fan fiction. Like, this is like a, an artifact or like a drug that makes you relive your worst fear or your worst memory or whatever. Yeah, it's one of those. The spider people are like evil, but also they're like, and we really like making you relive your traumatic backstories. <laughs> so here, wear this thing that makes you relive your traumatic backstory. And I was like, okay, all right, this person spends a lot of time on AO3, that's fine. Um, and that's how we learn, I believe, that Razor has a straight up dead wife. He had a wife and then she died somehow but we learn later how that happened uh and the other important facet of this story is that the ai for the spaceship uh it's like they're they're on an experimental super fast spaceship and it has an ai that is like a consciousness they pulled out of the green lantern battery i don't know whatever they don't really explain that very much uh and she's just like a friendly voice in the ship, but she also like has a character. She wants to be a Green Lantern and they're like, you're a spaceship. I don't know if you can. Um, and then they later meet a planet who becomes a Green Lantern. So it's like, I feel like Aya should be allowed to be a Green Lantern, whatever. What do I know? Um, and in this episode, uh, she leaves the ship for the first time. She like bops out at a little energy ball and she goes and rescues Razor by popping inside his traumatic backstory in the shape of his wife and being like, Hey, get your ass out of here and rescue those Green Lanterns. And uh, they reluctantly team up to save the day. And then he's like, all right, now arrest me. And they're like, nah, I think we'll just hang out and join you, you know, add you to the team. <laughs> and so they just have like this, this cranky Lancer who's, I mean, he, he like speed runs the Vegeta thing. He's not even that bad to start with. And then he just gets more and more sympathetic as time goes on, but he's still really cranky. Uh, and Aya... Uh, the ship's AI, like, builds herself a cute, like, humanoid robot body. And from that point forward, the plot of the show is Razor and Aya have a really cute romantic subplot developing. <laughs> and it's just really weirdly compelling. Uh, and it was, it's so funny because, like, obviously Hal Jordan is kind of important in the story. He is the nominal protagonist. But, like, the entire emotional heart of this show is just centered on Razor and Aya's whole thing. And it's just very funny to me. Um... It's also made by people who clearly have a lot of love and affection for, like, the greater, weirder shit in the Green Lantern, like, space of the comics. Because, like, early on, they introduce, like, Mogo, the planet that is a Green Lantern, shockingly quickly. <laughs> um, and, uh... <laughs> so, some of you who've been paying more attention to a lot of comic stuff might have noticed that there's a lot of things in Marvel that have suspicious parallels in DC and vice versa. <laughs> and I think Mogo is very explicitly just a copy of Ego, the living planet. Uh, you may notice their names are rather similar <laughs> uh, in the same way that basically like Thanos and Darkseid are just send-ups of each other and stuff like that. 
anyway, uh, yeah, Green Lantern, the animated series, uh, I really liked for a very long time, and I think it started going in directions I wasn't a huge fan of as they reached the ending of season two, and it also got canceled, so it ends on a sort of open-ended but positively optimistic note, um, but yeah, no, it's fun, they do a lot of weird shit, they bring in, like, the Orange Lanterns, or Singular, the Orange Lantern Singular, they bring in the Star Sapphires for a hot minute, uh, yeah, it's just interesting, so... Worth checking out. Um, Mogo was created by Alan Moore? That actually tracks. That's the kind of weird shit Alan Moore would come up with. <laughs> like, what if we had a sentient planet? Could he become a Green Lantern? Yes? Perfect. Um, and it's funny because... Uh, <laughs> there's a few bits that I thought were cute. Uh, because the way that they sort of manage having these characters with similar but ultimately distinct power sets is... It's a little bit shaky. The power levels of the rings varies wildly. It seems like they make a construct and then it immediately gets smashed to pieces and it's like, isn't that, whatever, it's the most powerful weapon in the universe, who cares? Uh, but they introduce this idea when they introduce blue lanterns, uh, which are like invented in the course of the show. They didn't exist before it. Uh, and the gist is that blue lanterns power up nearby green lanterns because hope makes willpower stronger, which actually makes sense. Um, so there's a bit when they're having, like, a climactic final battle and, all oh, the Green Lanterns are losing against the Red Lanterns or whatever. And then the Blue Lanterns show up and, like, power up everybody. And it's great. And it's, like, this beautiful blue energy field that, like, whooshes out and, like, powers up all the Green Lanterns to supercharge them. And it switches off all the Red Lantern rings, <laughs> which means Razor plummets out of the sky until he's caught by Aya. And he's like, that's never happened before. And I'm like, that's my boy. That's my angry Lancer type. I don't know. I just... I really like, you know, a simple meal well made, a really basic Lancer just played to the hilt, and it's a lot of fun for that. <sighs> okay, let's see. Uh, everyone keeps bringing up Wakfu. What? Wakfu cannot possibly be this interesting, all right? <laughs> I don't know anything about it, but so many of you have brought it up. <sighs> okay, um... Calvin and Hobbes is really good, and everybody should read all of it. That's not a hot take. Everybody knows Calvin and Hobbes slaps. Uh, let's see. Oh, no. Oh, no. The chat's speeding up again. You guys finally caught up. Okay. Obviously, I love Lancers. Lancers are always the most interesting character in any story they're in, because they get all the personality the hero's not allowed to have. Lancers also frequently have the angsty backstories and the solo arcs, and that means it's really easy to center arcs around them that's like, Lancer guy, you think that you have to do everything alone, but actually we all love and care about you. And it's like, what? You do? Wow, that's really unexpected for backstory reasons. And it's, I don't know, I just think it's really heartwarming. Like, if a Lancer is well-written and given a good supporting cast, they can be just incredibly heartwarming. They just, they're like a seed crystal for a lot of really good arcs. Um, oh, let's see. <laughs> now all I'm hearing is that Wakfu is meh at best. Then why does everyone keep bringing it up? What is it? <laughs> Whatever. Okay. <sighs> oh my god, Legion of Superheroes. God, that's, that's a throwback. Um, okay. So, I've only watched through Legion of Superheroes once. I remember really liking it. I also might have just been in kind of a weird headspace at the time. Uh, the gist of the Legion of Superheroes cartoon... It only ran for two seasons. It's based on the Legion of Superheroes in uh, DC Comics, which is essentially a superhero team from the future. They are from, like, the, the future timeline that the current events create. And because time travel in comics is not difficult or complicated, they cross over with the main guys sometimes. Uh, and basically, Legion of Superheroes begins uh, with the Legion coming back in time because they need Superman to help them out with a thing. The problem is they come back in time to a time where Superman is Superboy. He has never been Superman before. He is still on the Kent family farm. He isn't really in control of his powers yet super well. He doesn't really know what's going on. He's not an established presence. And he's not really up to speed. So they go back to the future with him. And they're like, all right, we need you to fight this bad guy. And he's like, I need to do what? And he's not great at it. And they're like, all right, you know what? You stay here. You're useless. We'll just take care of this ourselves. Obviously, he has a big moment where he goes off and grabs his super suit from, like, the local museum dedicated to his future exploits. And then, basically, he spends his time with the Legion of Superheroes learning how to be a better Superman. Um, 
And then at the end of season one, he goes back to his own time. And then at the beginning of season two, they're like, we need Superman to help us out with this. And this time they get grown up Superman. Uh, and grown up Superman hangs out with them for the rest of the season and solves a bunch of other problems, uh, including at one point, like a like a clone of Superman shows up, surprisingly not evil. Like he's actually a totally chill guy. He's just like Superman with spooky black eyes and like a mullet. It's fine. It's a good show. Uh, also, it's uh, it's interesting because the show has it's not a canon romantic subplot because it is not reciprocal, but it is a canonical acknowledged in-universe crush between Brainiac 5 and Superman. Brainiac 5 has a crush on Superman. And this show came out, I want to say, early 2000s. And Brainiac 5 and Superman are both guys. So I think that's kind of interesting. And, like, he's never... he. I think he gets a little bit of, like, ribbing from the other teammates just because it's such an obvious crush. But, like, it's never really framed as, like, that's super weird or whatever. And, like, Superman never, like, shoots him down or anything about it. It's just kind of sweet and cute. So that was cool. Um, <laughs> adult Superman does show up. I remember because there's, like, a joke where they're like, we're going to get Superman back. And I think Lightning Lad, who's like the Team Lancer, I don't like him very much. He's not a great Lancer, uh, is like, oh, can't wait for that skinny nerd to show up. And then like adult beefy Superman shows up and is like, who are you calling skinny? And I'm like, yeah, because he's built like a fucking refrigerator. Anyway, good stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, I have not watched Gendy Tartakovsky's Primal. I've seen bits from it. Uh, it looks interesting. I think the thing is, like, <laughs> Gendy has, like, a gradient of gendy in his work. And at the very high end, it is completely silent, crazy choreographed fights between one hero and a giant army of interchangeable mooks. And I like that in moderation. <laughs> but it can't be the whole thing. And the thing with Primal is that there's no spoken word dialogue. It's a very interesting premise for a cartoon. It's a bit much for me personally. <laughs> oh my god, why would you bring up Samurai Jack season five? Okay, um, <laughs> let's, how about this? How about we, we start winding down? Maybe we'll make it an even three hours, call it another 15 minutes, I can get my voice a break. But, uh... Samurai Jack season five. <sighs> Remember earlier in the stream where I was like, Firefly was probably so well liked because it was canceled before its time and didn't have time to get bad. And then I was like, remember when Young Justice happened and everyone was sad when it got canceled after season two and then they wanted it brought back, but I was kind of glad that it was dead. I feel like Samurai Jack season five is like the rule of three for this. It's like everybody loved the first four seasons. When we heard we could get it back, we really wanted it back. And then it probably should have just stayed dead. I don't know. Um, season five had some fucking baffling decisions in it. And I feel like it must have been executive meddling. Because I cannot conceive of why a show so deeply unromantic as Samurai Jack would hinge its entire final season on a romantic subplot with a newly introduced character none of us had time to get invested in. And, like, a character who's canonically explicitly stated to be, at this point, 75, despite looking like he's 25. And then just... I, it feels like the the show creators didn't want to do it because the the episode where they start the romantic subplot is like one meet cute trope after another purposefully contrived to be as implausible as possible. And it's just incredibly uncomfortable and weird to watch. It does not feel cute or like heartwarming. And, like, they straight up cut straight from, like, staring lovingly into each other's eyes to just, like, a protracted makeout session. And I'm like, this has to be a joke, right? Like, this is a joke written by somebody who does not understand the appeal of this storyline just like me. Just like how I don't understand this. Like, that has to be why this is so physically painful. Um, and then at the end, they get back to the past. Spoiler alert. They completely erase the timeline of the future. 
never ever discussing the emotional and ethical ramifications of erasing the entire timeline that Jack has spent 50 years in, the timeline full of people who exist, the families they started. It's never even mentioned that they're erasing this entire timeline to get back to the past. They get back to the past with Ashi, and then they, they get married, and then Ashi falls over, and she's like, if you defeated Aku, I would have never existed, and she fucking disappears. So I suffered through that shit for nothing! <laughs> anyway. So, I don't know why they did that. It made me really mad. <laughs> it was just... Remember when I was like, oh my god, why is the movie ending to the Troll Hunters slash Tales of Arcadia series so bad? Why did they do that? Um, it's like that. It's like all the writing was so good up to this point. Why the fuck would you do this? So. <sighs> I'm normally pretty tolerant of romantic subplots. Most of them I don't think are great. A lot of them I don't understand the appeal of at all. But I understand why they exist, you know? I think it's a lot of it is just a big collective social blind spot for, like, this is how this must go. This is how these characters must interact. But with those two, I was really rooting for, like, like a mentor-student, like, Wolverine and X-23 dynamic. But then as soon as Jack shaved off his hobo beard, I was like, oh boy, here it comes. They made him look young and handsome again. And lo and behold, they started making out. And honestly, my biggest complaint about this isn't even that, like... Like I said, I feel like it had to have been written by somebody who also hated what they were doing. What annoys me is that there is an honest-to-God plot hole in it. <laughs> and I've talked about this in another stream. I don't want to just repeat myself. But, like, the character of Ashi, like, when she's introduced, she's uh, she's an assassin. She's a daughter of Aku. And she's, like, covered in this, like, black bodysuit substance that it's implied is, like, burned onto her skin or something. Which basically means she's running around naked the whole time, which is super weird and uncomfortable. But anyway, um, she uh, when she becomes a good guy and she goes off to find Jack, uh, she like has like a like a big moment and she like scrapes this stuff off herself, and then she's like woo, and then she looks down at herself as she is now naked and she's like uh oh, and then she runs off and like makes herself an outfit out of like leaves, and then she runs off and does that, and then in the episode of one thousand agonizing meat cutes, uh. They get attacked by, like, clothing-dissolving acid slugs. Oh, no! <laughs> you see why I think that this had to be written by somebody who hated everything that they were writing? Like, anyway. <sighs> so they dissolve her outfit. And Jack is like, Oh my gosh, Ashi! You're naked! Ah! And she's like, What? What's the problem? And he's like, Oh, well, you see, boys and girls are different! And, like, takes off his kimono and puts it on her to, like, cover her up. And I was like... Ashi, you know what nudity is. That's why you made yourself the clothes. <laughs> so, yeah, the Born Sexy Yesterday plot hole hurts me more than any amount of oopsies our hands accidentally touched on this bus pole on this giant bug we're riding. Fucking anyway. All right, what else was I talking about? Um, I don't know what Lex is, guys. I don't know why I keep bringing it up. Sorry. Uh... I've already talked about Dragon Prince. Have not watched Stargate SG-1. Um, let's see. I watched, I want to say, the first season of Jessica Jones and then just kind of stopped. I think it's one of those cases where, like, the finale of the first season was, like, really good. So I was like, all right, I'm good. I don't need to see the rest of it. Because that's where they kill Purple Man. And it's a really good moment. Also, I'm not going to lie, I was one of those people who watched Jessica Jones because I was like, hey, David Tennant's in this. <laughs> So, uh, it was a really good moment. Uh, he was a really hateable villain. It's interesting because David Tennant, like, he's a good actor, but he kind of always plays David Tennant. You know what I mean? Like, they're all variants. Like, they all do different things. But, like, on some level, it's always David Tennant. So, it was interesting how there was so little, like, physical difference between his portrayal of Kilgrave and, like, his portrayal of the Tenth Doctor and his portrayal of Crawley in Good Omens but Kilgrave was so skeezy and punchable and the other two were so lovable. And I just thought that was interesting. Um, ooh, Paranatural the comic. Uh, Paranatural's quite good. Uh, I think the creator is currently like, I'm, I don't remember exactly why he had an explanation for it. Uh, basically, instead of posting comics, he's been sort of posting like 
prose versions of the story that he would be telling with the comics with like little illustrative inserts it personal preference i have trouble getting into that part but the comic is fantastic very much recommend it so yeah check that out um and i i kind of hope he gets back to the comic park later because i i really like it i really love the art and the way he does the layouts like that so anyway um uh <laughs> Oh boy, Fushigi Yugi. I brought this one up earlier because it was part of the um, the early shoujo isekai era. Uh, the premise of Fushigi Yugi is that the main character is um, sucked into a storybook. Uh, the The premise being if she gets to the end, she gets a wish granted. and She's like filling the role of the heroine of the story. Uh, <laughs> and it is noteworthy in my head because the main love interest is voiced by David Hayter of solid snake fame <laughs> and he's mostly doing like an anime boy voice but anytime there's like combat or effort noises the solid snake comes out <laughs> um i don't strictly recommend fushigi yugi <laughs> um it's okay uh just to explain the basic part of the premise and then not have to explain anything else about why it's weird the main character, the role she's playing in the story is that she's like a priestess of this, like, god, and her powers that come from that are tied with her virginity. And you can guess from there what a lot of the primary threats in the story are, and why I don't strictly recommend this story. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Anyway, uh, Star Trek Lower Decks. I've seen clips from Lower Decks. I've seen specifically the clip where Riker shows up because it got, like, clipped and put on YouTube on its own. Looked very fun. Um, again, I, I mentioned I'm not particularly impressed by series where the joke is, hey, look, it's this thing you're familiar with, but we can swear now. So, I don't know. Lower Decks didn't really um, grab me, but I'm glad it exists and I'm glad people are having fun with it. Um... <laughs> I was chat just caught up to the uh, the the Fushigi Yugi explanation, and it is very funny for me watching all of you suffer along with me. Um, it uh, yeah, it's something. Uh, okay, uh, haven't watched Babylon Five. Babylon Five is one of the only like OG sci-fi shows that I just haven't experienced anything of. Don't even really know much about it. Um, I know that it was influential. I just haven't really watched it. Um, ooh, Dune. Okay, I recommend the new Dune movie. Very much so. I think it is gorgeous. The soundtrack is incredible. Um, the scene that made me conclude that this was a good movie came at basically exactly the right time in the runtime because about an hour into the movie is the first time I got up and, like, checked the timestamp. I was like, okay... We have been here for a while. What's going on? But that is around when they do the first scene with the sandworm. So they knew what they were doing. Uh, and when they started that scene, they were like, all right, we got worm sign. It's five minutes out. And I was like, oh, man, it would be really cool if we just stayed here for the whole five minutes in real time. Hey, isn't it interesting how the soundtrack of this scene seems to incorporate the sound of a ticking clock? And then... Yeah, we stay with them the whole five minutes. They realistically make you believe, like, okay, we got some time to, okay, we're running out of time. Um, and the way that they do that scene in conjunction with Paul's first exposure to the spice and what it starts doing to him is beautiful. There's a, a great bit in that scene. Like, this is the scene where I started genuinely, like, leaning forward and grinning I don't tend to, like, physically or out loud react to the things I am watching. So that's how you know it's good. Um, and there's a great callback in that scene that I was told later had, like, a secret double meaning in it, which I thought was cool. Uh, but early on uh, in the movie, when Paul is sort of sparring with uh, Gurney Halleck, I think, uh, he's like, Gurney's like, oh, you know, you're not watching the door. And he says, like, I can hear your footsteps, old man. Uh... And when he's having his sort of, like, spice-induced weird fugue state, and he's cl clearly kind of, like, not really sure what's going on, but he's really out of it, he sort of murmurs, like, I can hear your footsteps, old man. 
And then, like, in a jump cut, Gurney's behind him, grabs him, and goes to drag him back to the ship before they get fucking eaten by the worm. And I was just like, hell yeah. (laughs) So, and you gotta understand, this was only, like, a couple weeks after I watched the, like, the other Dune movie. (laughs) You know, the old one. (laughs) The bad one. Uh, So what I recommend you do is you watch the old bad one first, and then you immediately go to this one. (laughs) I think that is the the ideal way to experience these movies. Uh, and the, the cool double meaning I've heard about in that specific scene is that, like, old man or, like, old man of the desert is, like, like a Fremen uh, nickname or something for the Shai Hulud. So he's he's talking to Gurney, but maybe he's also talking to the worm. Oh, well, that's kind of cool. So anyway, I thought it was cool. Uh, yes, definitely recommend Dune 2022. I mean, it's not underrated. Everyone knows Dune 2022 fucking slaps, but, like... You know, everyone should still watch it. Uh, You do not hear a cat in the background. That is my chair. Sadly, despite it being a guitar stool for specifically musicians, it makes noises when I move the back. So that feels like kind of a design flaw for something you'd probably put in a recording studio. Anyway, um, let's see. (sighs) I've heard good things about what we do in the shadows. I just, I don't know. (laughs) Um, I know it's doing interesting stuff. I just never really found the time or the inclination to super dive into it. Um, Oh my God, Lunatics Unleashed. Why would you say, why would you speak that forbidden name right when we're coming up on three hours? Okay, Lunatics Unleashed, for those of you who do not know, is a 2000s edgy animated reboot slash sequel to the Looney Tunes. All of the main characters are the distant descendants of classic Looney Tunes characters. They all have superpowers, and they are all superheroes. And it feels like the showrunners didn't know what to do with that. Because almost all the bad guys are just, like, humans? Like... With powers, usually, but they're just, like, regular-ass people. The only exception (laughs) is that one of the bad guys is, like, a descendant of Elmer Fudd flying around in an Iron Man suit. And he's, like, a Boba Fett-style bounty hunter. And that was fucking hilarious. Um, Everything else is just, like, like, bad guys that wouldn't have looked super out of place in, like static shock or batman beyond or whatever uh and like the tone fluctuates wildly but not in a good way (laughs) um like i've just talked about how i like it when shows go from really emotional highs to emotional lows but this is more like the show can't decide if it's a serious superhero show or looney tunes And really what it is, is they never, ever do the Looney Tunes thing. So it's like, there's no reason why this character should look like Bugs Bunny. There's no reason at all. He has a fucking sword. Of course he does. Um, It's so weird and dumb. Also, like, I don't know. I don't know if this is just me being weird. (laughs) But they have, a like, a bad guy. I don't remember what her deal is. She's got, like, shadow powers or something. And, like... She captures the Wily e. Coyote style guy, and he's kind of funny because, like, his main thing is that he's got, like, he's a super genius, but his other thing is that he is fully indestructible because, of course, Wily e. Coyote is, like, blown up and dropped off cliffs and squished and, you know, all that stuff, and he just bounces back. So they were just like, we're going to make this his canonical superpower, cellular regeneration. And I was like, that kind of reframes everything about that in a more horrifying light, but that's okay. Um... Anyway, so the creepy shadow bad guy, like, she, like, kidnaps him, and then they spend the whole episode flirting, and I was like, you are a human woman, and he is a cartoon coyote, and I don't feel comfortable with anything that's happening right now, (laughs) so that's fine. There's also, like, a whole episode where it's, like, I think it's that the Roadrunners, because, of course, one of them is a Roadrunner, I think it's that his family is racist against coyotes. (laughs) Um, I don't know. It's a fucking weird show. I... I, like, I watched it, and I really wanted it to be really bad or really, like, so bad it's good. 
But instead, it was just kind of mediocre and tonally inconsistent. And that was a huge bummer. Like, I, I wish it were better. I wish it were crazier because then I'd probably rewatch it. But instead, I'm just like, I don't know what this show wants me to feel, but I don't like any of it. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Um... I do want more people to watch Lunatics Unleashed just to, like, reaffirm my perspective on it because I, I feel like like nobody else on the planet has watched this show. <laughs> but I I think that the, the funniest thing about it that I can say is that the vocal performances also kind of have to be inconsistent because of the tonal inconsistency of the show itself. So, like, all the characters mostly talk like cartoon characters. But they also have superhero style fight scenes with corresponding effort and pain noises that sound a lot more serious. So you have someone going from like, hey, what's up, Doc? You don't need to shoot that laser gun at me to ah, ooh, ah, the pain. And I'm just like, I don't fucking understand anything that's happening here, but it's very funny. <laughs> so it's fucking bananas. Anyway, okay, I've actually already talked about Order of the Stick, the webcomic. I have recommended it. It's good. Um, oh no, did Lunatics Unleashed inspire furries? Can't they be inspired by something better? Like, I don't know, that Robin Hood Disney movie that people seem to get weird about? <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> you can't fool me into talking about Gravity Falls. Gravity Falls isn't underrated. Everybody knows it's good. <laughs> Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, you in the chat with the ah, ooh, ah, my infinite power, you get it. That was the whole vibe of watching Lunatics Unleashed. <laughs> okay, uh, we're gonna, let, I'm gonna say we're probably gonna wrap this up in five minutes because I can feel my throat not super happy with me right now. Um, but let's, oh my god, Outlaw Star, I haven't thought about that in ages. Uh, Outlaw Star was like an old school-ish anime that I think is mostly known nowadays because it's got this cat girl character. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, she's kind of the... It's a very standard five-man band arrangement. The cat girl is the big guy of the group. She is a boisterous bruiser from a, from a proud warrior race of cat people. Uh, and if you look at her design, you're like... Okay, I can just tell that people had feelings about this character. <laughs> so that's really all I've ever seen about Outlaw Star since then. Uh, I watched a bunch of it. I remember nothing about the plot. I tried reading the manga and I could barely find it, which is kind of how you know that it's not soups well known. But yeah, the yeah, person in chat, Aisha Clan Clan, you know it. That's the girl. <laughs> She's just this like buff, like wharf style proud warrior race person who's also a sexy cat girl like <laughs> i don't know if you guys have seen this it's probably a very specific niche meme uh that mostly tumblr likes where they like treat fandom spaces like they have like biodiversity and like ecological like trophic cascade ramifications um and there's been some discussion about how like modern cat girls are like the sad domesticated version of like the 90s and 80s feral cat girl and uh this character is pretty indicative of what that looked like so if you're curious about your anime history uh i don't know you could look that up i guess <laughs> um <laughs> okay uh oh yeah and also i think she can turn into a, like a big buff alien tiger thingy if she needs to but like i mean you know why they don't you know why she doesn't do that if she did that, she'd look less like a sexy lady. Okay, um, oh my god, how have I been talking for three hours? <laughs> okay, gosh, I wonder why my throat's a little bit sore. It's not like I've been yelling for three hours. Um, haven't seen Secret Saturday or One Star Races. Um, the Looney Tunes show, like the original one, it's good, obviously. Uh, and really weird. It's like, oh, we're gonna do a fun cartoon about, like, wacky little like basically Aesop's fable characters and also sometimes we're just going to do a whole episode where we animate shit to classical music and opera I cannot believe that What's Opera Doc exists I can't believe it we're so lucky 
Okay. Uh, oh no. Oh no. Chat's getting faster again. Um, okay. You know, okay. We don't have time for the whole Star Wars discussion, but I saw someone bring up Star Wars Rebels and Bad Batch. And I, I didn't watch Rebels. I tried Rebels. Wasn't my thing. I was interested by Bad Batch, and then I just didn't. Like, I didn't hear anything about it that particularly made me interested. I didn't hear any interesting plot developments. I just didn't watch it. I heard only interesting things about it beforehand. Oh, it's Clone Wars, but more. That's cool. And I had the same reaction to Clone Wars Season 6 or 7 or whatever the last one was. Like, oh, that's cool. Never watched it. And I didn't hear anything about it afterwards that made me want to watch it. And I don't really know why. And I, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I just finished watching Kenobi, and I really did enjoy that. So it's not like I've just been completely desensitized to all these Star Wars spinoffs. It's just like, I don't know what happened with those. I heard about them, I heard people getting hyped about them, and then I just didn't hear anything about them afterwards. So, <sighs> anyway. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, okay, chat is <sighs> going pretty, pretty speedy. Um... All right. I don't know what Spider Riders is. <laughs> I uh, I do not believe you who are telling me that Rebels got good. I've seen clips. I think Rebels contains good, but that does not mean it is good. Uh, I've talked about Infinity Train. I've talked about Escaflown, what I know of it. Uh, talked about Generator Rex, Earthsea. Um, I mean, I'll always go to bat for my, my girl Ursula K. Le Guin. And Earthsea is a very good fantasy series, especially if you are curious about the evolutionary development of fantasy as a genre. Because I think, you know, everyone focuses on Tolkien, including me. I'm very guilty of that. But Le Guin is a very important milestone in the development of modern fantasy. Uh, and she's criminally overlooked, despite having a huge influence on everything that came after her. She basically came up with the concept of like true name magic in fantasy um and that's pretty fucking big so like definitely recommend the Earthsea series uh i read it i think when i was too young to get it and then i recently reread uh wizard of Earthsea, and it's really good so definitely recommend that i don't know what pen zero part time hero is sorry putting it in caps won't help <laughs> um uh boy um speed racer movie i know it's you indigo you can't fool me <laughs> well but she isn't here to complain so i'll close out the stream by uh saying that i think the speed racer movie is very impressive for how much it commits to its own bit i think it's absolutely fucking baffling that the team that made it is the same team that made the matrix <laughs> um i think it is an interesting attempt to finally adapt the style of anime to live action, but it was not good <laughs> and did not succeed where it wanted to succeed. And now we have a good live action anime adaptation in the live action Ronin Kenshin movies, and they don't look anything like the Speed Racer movie, and that's pretty indicative stylistically of what's going on there. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, <sighs> the Speed Racer movie is taking a lot of interesting risks with the way that it puts the movie together, cinematography, the editing, the acting choices, uh, it's, I don't even want to say ambitious because it doesn't feel like it's trying new things. It feels like it is very confidently stating and doing new things. Hey, quit snitching, Adam. <laughs> um, <laughs> I see you in there. She can't save you from me and my hot takes. Uh, anyway, uh, basically... I think that as a movie, Speed Racer is interesting, but not good. It is very, very high saturation. It's, <laughs> I think I mentioned this, uh, when I first watched the movie, at Indigo's insistence, um, I thought it was a really interesting creative choice that the first scene, which was a flashback to the idyllic childhood times of Speed Racer, his actual name, <laughs> uh, 
was that they were so oversaturated and cartoony. Like I was watching an episode of that fucking show Sporticus in it. You know the one. I thought it was a really cool creative choice. And then the rest of the movie happened and I was like, oh, no, that's just what the movie is going to look like from now on. Okay, cool. Um, so that was something. Uh, the plot was theoretically extant. Uh, <laughs> the bad guy's evil plan, he explains his evil plan and then shows footage of what it will look like when he does the evil plan. And then it cuts to him having done the evil plan. And I kind of got confused by the timeline of the movie when that happened because I couldn't tell if we were still in the and that's how it's gonna be when I do my evil plan part so that was something uh and then all this fucking stuff about his brother was I mean I know that's from the show that's fine that's how it always goes um <laughs> anyway Speed Racer is an interesting movie that really commits to its own bit but it's not a good movie and it's okay to think that you know, we don't need to pretend here. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so that's, <laughs> I'm gonna have to wind down the underrated media hot takes power hour, three hours, um, and then down the rest of this pot of tea. Oh my god, uh, but, uh, thank y'all for tuning in. This was very fun, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I had a very good time discussing this much media, although I think next time we're gonna need to choose something with, uh, I think for topics, I need, like, a middle ground. Because here, I can either go off on 15-minute tangents about Legion of Superheroes, or I can just go through the list in chat and say I haven't heard of any of these. Uh, whereas last time when we did the tropes thing, it was like, you know, even if it's like a weird little non-trope, I can go on a little tangent about like, oh, yeah, you know, they use it here and it's kind of cool. I don't know why you asked me about this. But with these, it's like, I don't fucking know what that is. Um, so, we can, you know, we'll, we'll workshop it. This is only, like, the third time I've done this, so we're we're getting it down to a science. Um, but, uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, pretty impressed that we stayed around 2,000 viewers this whole time. Uh, <laughs> peeping, peaking somewhere closer to 2,500, which makes sense for, like, late on a Thursday. Uh, but, yeah, I hope this was halfway coherent and fun. I'm <laughs> probably gonna have to listen back through this to add some timestamps. Uh, and I assume I will be cringing the whole way at my rapidly deteriorating vocal quality. But, uh, yeah, uh, we got a... Regular video coming out tomorrow. It's one of blues. Should be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, <laughs> while they're off at VidCon, I'll probably do a couple more of these. So <laughs> I guess I'll catch you later. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, peace. <laughs>